brother. sound for a minute. I understand that Rohan wants to just test some sound. Is that correct? You are. You are correct. Ah, are hello, you hearing Rohan. me well? Hello. Yes, we are. We are. So that's Great. not that's not an issue. And your camera was on fine earlier, so everything, sh yeah, that's that's great. Great. I'm great. Thank you. You, you. You're happy? You're confident? I am great. Good, good, good. All right. Oh, welcome, Usman. How are you? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're, we're live on Facebook Live, so I don't want to um, embarrass anybody right now, but as long as your cameras are, are, are running, um, we can go back to the holding slide and music, but because we're streaming, it's very difficult to, 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 to disconnect and, and whilst we're trying to do everything at the same time. So if, if, um, I'll, um, if we can just, if you don't want your face on the screen, I'd, I would recommend as, as you're here, actually, um, well, Doc, uh, uh, Usman, uh, just just so you're um, as for your, for your awareness, Dr. Leah Makar is here as well, and, and you know, you've not met with her yet, but she's got her camera turned off because, as I said, we're running the the holding slide. She was live at eight o'clock, but you, she sent through an email for you to, to look at. Um, if you could just re you review that, um, I think I think if I could all encourage you to mute yourselves now, and we can go back to the holding slide for now, so we can um, because, as I said, we're live on Facebook, so we don't want to be saying too much. All right, um, over to you, Irene. Thank you very much. Oops. Morning, SG. Um, good morning. Good morning. We're, Good morning, how are you? Um, good to see you. We are live on Facebook at the moment, um, so we are limiting to what we're saying. We, we, we had the speaker briefing at eight and we're just about to set the, the, the PowerPoint holding slide with the background music until, until nine o'clock. So if, as long as you're happy to... to we, uh, you can keep your camera on if you wish, um, but it will be on Facebook for the next 20 minutes. So you might want to just to, to hide yourself. Um, sorry, I can put my camera on if you like. <laughs> I am here. Um, yes. Good to see you. Um, but I'll, I'll turn mine, mine off until two minutes to nine. All right. All right. Good morning to everyone. Good, good morning, morning. I, I good hope morning. you all are having a great day. A three o'clock in the morning start is not particularly appealing. <laughs> <but> <laughs> I, um, yes, we all made it. And I know we have. Uh, it, it's tough. But it works, and I'm very happy to have all of you all join us. And it's good to see Dr. Leah Marker was able to join us. Good to have you. And I'm looking forward to a great um, forum. So, um, yes, I'm just going to make a few more adjustments. So bear with me as I you know I'm going to switch off my camera for a bit. And uh, yes, we have a few minutes, about 20 more minutes. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, SG. Thank you, SG. Um, good morning, Juma. I can see you're logging in as well. So good morning. Um, how are you? Good morning. Fine. Thank you. Good, good, good. We are just, um, we're live on Facebook at the moment. So we're going to go to the holding slide um, and just play some background music until nine o'clock. So um, because um, we've done sort of the prep, but as we can see that your camera is, is now on, which is good. Um, the do you have yeah your, your sound jimmy can you just say a few words because i think your sound's fine oh uh, thank you very much uh, robert and uh, good morning or afternoon or um af yes afternoon for the rest of the delegates thank you very much 
Right. Well, I'm going to pass over to Irene again. So, Irene, if you could just uh, run the whole thing slide and and if you can mute mute all. So um, for now, until until the the session starts, and then we'll go straight into the speakers. All right. Best of luck, everybody. Thank you.
Morning, Bernadette. Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's, How are you? It's very good. It's it's rare that I wear a tie these days, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> good morning, Rupert. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. Hi. What a great event you've got today. I, I thought this is just a brilliant, uh, a brilliant agenda. Good. Thank you. Um, yes. We're just, 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 just so you're aware, we're starting in eight minutes time. We'll, we'll keep the time and um, we're just playing at the opening slide at the moment with some background music. We're live on Facebook, so I don't want us to say too much because, you know, it's not, it's, it's, we're, st we're open now for people to view in. We've got 14 yeah. attendees in the, in the site watching in as well. So, We'll just, um, if you've got anything, um, any questions, just take it offline and we can have a chat in the chat room and um, I'll introduce you during the opening. Opening. All right, thank you very much for your time this, this morning. Thank you, Irene.
Good morning. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to, to, to see uh, so many people here at nine o'clock. Right, so we're going to start um, just, just right now. So, okay. Hello and welcome to the Commonwealth Human Resources and ICT Forum 2021. I am Robert Heyman, the manager of events at the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, um, and I am the MC for the forum. Let us start this, the, the Commonwealth Telecommunications first event for the new financial year 2021 to 2022 with an invocation in song. It's, 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 um, Lord, I will Afzal Ibrahim, Minister of State for Communication, Science and Technology, the Maldives, other Honourable Commonwealth Ministers in attendance, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Rupert McNeil, Chief People Officer and Non-Executive Director, the Cabinet Office, Government of the United Kingdom, Ms. Bernadette Lewis, Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organisation, members of the CTO, chairs, speakers, and panelists, delegates from the Commonwealth and beyond. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the 11th Commonwealth Human Resources and ICT Forum and first virtual edition, the theme of which is understanding the new digital normal, fostering organizational readiness in the 21st century. I am pleased to confirm we have received 205 registrations from 45 countries, from the Pacific through to the Americas. To our members in the Pacific, good evening. Good afternoon to our members in Asia. And good morning to our delegates in Africa, Europe, the Caribbean and Americas. We are now also live on Facebook through the CTO Facebook page. Now with all formalities observed, I wish to hand over to Secretary General Lewis, who was appointed in August 2020 and is the first female Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. A national of Trinidad and Tobago, Secretary General Lewis was also the first female Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, the CTU, a role that she held for over a decade. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. On behalf of the Chairman and members of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, I welcome you to this 2021 edition of the Commonwealth Human Resources and ICT Forum, which has as its theme, understanding the new digital normal, fostering organizational readiness in the 21st century. The rapid pace of technological innovation has erased constraints of space and time 
facilitating real-time interactive multimedia communications and ushering us into the age of the fourth industrial revolution in which the digital, physical, and biological realms coalesce. These changes have been altering perceptions and dispositions of workers, the very nature of work, the work environment, and actually leaving us to contemplate what the future of work would be. It is for this reason the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization instituted the Commonwealth Human Resource and ICT Forum in 2005 to raise awareness and educate on the trends in information and communication technologies and their potential to transform the work environment, the nature of work, and the workforce. The CTO recognized the need for human resources and ICT practitioners and professionals who were involved in capacity building and fostering organizational change to have such insight. Now, fast forward to 2021. The ICT revolution has been changing the world dismantling the traditional frameworks that govern the way we live and work. And now the COVID-19 pandemic has catapulted us into an era of individual insecurity, business calamity, multi-sectoral crises, economic turmoil, and great uncertainty. This is our new collective normal. These phenomenal changes are impacting the work environment in dramatic ways. And my own onboarding as the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization is an instructive example of the emerging work environment and reflects many of the themes and sub-themes of this forum. I could not have conceived of joining a global organization remotely from Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. I have never physically met my staff. They are in London and working from home. Technology has certainly changed the way that the CTO works now. And we have had to adopt innovative ICT platforms and technologies, the technological tools and facilities, the cloud had to be provided to connect me to my staff and to ensure that the staff could continue performing their duties. We were experiencing issues that were debilitating to the smooth operation of the Secretariat and we had to arrange online training. We also had to develop the means to reinforce the learnings with the members of staff. At staff meetings, I would uh, stress the principles that were uh, put forward during the training sessions. And I asked the staff with issues to meet informally and apply the learnings of the training to resolve their issues. This was an integrated approach to capacity building for operational effectiveness. I found that much of my time was spent speaking and encouraging members of staff as the isolation of lockdown restrictions took its toll and COVID fears for the family members and friends abroad arose. I spent a lot of time speaking to the HR manager and now in retrospect, I recognize that we were indeed rethinking work and the HR function all of these things were happening simultaneously as we strove to, to maintain the operational effectiveness of the CTO Secretariat. There's much to be done to ensure that the Commonwealth, sec, uh, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization is relevant in this era of uncertainty and ready and able to support our members as they navigate the turbulent waters of health crises, 
economic contagion, geopolitical change, climate change, and inevitably, the challenges that will arise in our collective future. So I'm looking forward in this forum to developing a roadmap for organizational readiness. More than ever, human resources and ICT practitioners need a foundation of understanding of the technology trends, their impact on the HR management uh, function and the implications for organizational effectiveness. So I'm very glad that so many of you from around the world have joined us today. I am looking forward to a time of active engagement with speakers and panelists and a rich discussion that would guide us in all of our work going forward. My hope is for a rewarding and impactful forum. So I thank you all. Thank you, Madam SG. Now, the next part of this program is, 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 is in two parts. We have a keynote address and we have a Q&A afterwards. So I would invite all delegates to use the Q&A facility. Any questions in chat room, in the chat room won't be answered. So there's the, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom facility, you can see a Q&A button. Um, once, uh, whilst uh, Mr. McNeil, and I'll introduce him in a minute, is speaking, if you could put your questions there and that will help me in the, um, after his speech to, to look through and, 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 and present the questions that are there. Okay, so thank you. So our next speaker is Mr. Rupert McNeil. And Mr. McNeil was appointed government chief people, people officer on the 1st of January, 2016, joining the civil service from Lloyd's Banking Group, where he was the group HR director. As government chief people officer, Rupert is responsible for delivery of the civil, the civil service people strategy. And he provides leadership on a full range of people issues, including talent, capability, inclusion, capacity, leadership, pay, performance, employee relations, culture, and behaviors. Now his, his keynote address is, is called how, is titled How Technology is Changing the Public Service. And I will hand over now to Mr. Mr. McNeil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert, uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to um, fellow Commonwealth uh, colleagues and, uh, and friends. And thank you very much, uh, Madam Secretary General, for uh, those great um, kickoff, uh, kickoff words. Um, what, I would, uh, what I'd like to do is, um, I hope, convey a bit of my passion for uh, the structure um, and agenda that you're talking about uh, today, that we're talking about today, because I fundamentally believe that um, technology, communications and human resources form um, a combined enabler in um, modern organisations. And it is fantastic to see such a powerful agenda as you have um, for this conference. Um, and which also gets to the key point about what it's all for, which is um, organizational readiness and uh, organizational uh, effectiveness. Um, let me start though with the current, uh, the current context and uh, where we are. Uh, for those of you who may have had a chance to see the Times of, uh, of London today, um, there are a couple of photos in it, um, in that newspaper that uh, I think express the extraordinary times uh, that we're in, both the, um, the challenges and the opportunities. The challenges um, is the, uh, the photograph of um, the oxygen tanks, uh, which are being uh, used by our colleagues and friends in, in India to deal with uh, their very difficult uh, situation with, uh, with COVID. And then um, on another page, there is, um, and, and who knew that we would be dealing with such, uh, such a difficult, uh, complex thing as this pandemic, although um, it was on all of our risk registers for, uh, for many years. So uh, I think um, that's, that's worth, uh, worth bearing in mind. But what you'll also see uh, is a photograph of Prime Minister Modi um, uh, in a video conference call with Prime Minister Johnson of the United Kingdom. Um, and to me, uh, that's really quite amazing. And the fact that we can do this event uh, virtually, um, as Madam Secretary General, you referenced, is also uh, quite amazing. It shows 
um, the the potential of communications uh, technology and how it is affecting uh, all of us um, and creating new opportunities and new ways to interact um, with our colleagues and with citizens. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment, if I may. And one way I think about the 21st century, framing the discussion that uh, we're having today, is um, that I sort of feel the 21st century started last March. Um, I sort of feel that we're still in the throes of the 20th century, and maybe that is uh, partly because we were still dealing in the UK with leaving the European Union, uh, lots of other um, uh, legacy issues. But then suddenly, I think we've been brought up short uh, by this pandemic, um, and it makes us realise that uh, we are in a different time, uh, a different time and place. And there's an opportunity, particularly as we return to our workplaces, uh, to think about what that um, what that means, the opportunities it creates, and also some of the new risks um, associated with it. So, uh, in my mind, uh, we're we're really now in um, the first year uh, of the uh, of the 21st century. What I thought I'd like to do is to describe how I personally, in my role, think about the role of technology and human resources in organisations and how it contributes to organisational effectiveness. Um, and through that, talk about a number of things that uh, relate to what the impact of that is on how we provide uh, public services and what that means for what we, um, for what we do. So the way that I, um, I frame um, organisations, any organisation in the public or private sector, is that every organisation has a fundamental purpose. Um, we're very fortunate in um, the public services uh, in our organisations around the world uh, in the Commonwealth because um, public, public service is our, is our mission, it is our purpose, uh, creating great outcomes to um, improve the lives of the citizens of our, of our nations. So purpose for us is perhaps um, uh, a, a unique thing and it also allows us to collaborate uh, in this way as we, um, as we do that. We're part of a global sector of public service where um, unlike many other sectors where its members compete with each other, we only gain from collaboration as this event, uh, as this event shows. So we take purpose, then underneath purpose is the strategy to fulfill that purpose. And that may take many different forms. It may involve outsourcing. It may involve doing the activity directly for the citizen. Um, it may involve um, distributing uh, public funds to other organizations in the voluntary sector, for example, to do their work. That's the strategy. And then every strategy has an operating model. And that operating model is the way in which we will provide our services and deliver the strategy. And one of the interesting things about um, what's happened in the UK public service is that operating models have been uh, dramatically shifted um, as part of um, the COVID response. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And then underlying that, um, underlying the, um, the purpose, the strategy, the operating model, are the enablers, the corporate enablers that make the operating model possible um, and make it work effectively. Um, and you could list many of these, but for me, the four main ones are money, data, technology, and people. And those are common enablers in any organization. Um, perhaps 20 years ago, we wouldn't have included data, although it was always there, but I think now we do, uh, we do think about that. And I'll come back to that in a moment also. So with those four enablers, um, we're also seeing something that is very distinctly 21st century in my mind, which is that they are increasingly entangled. That's why um, the, and interdependent, and that's why this conference is so uh, great. And it does recognize that interdependency between technology and, um, and people and how you optimize that, which is the job of HR and technology, uh, technology functions. So in that intertwined world, what are the issues that we are that we are seeing? Well, the first is uh, around the way we deliver public services, and uh, two aspects of that. One is the um, the fact that we can now communicate um, remotely and deliver services uh, remotely. And uh, if I give three very practical examples of that, which uh, I'm sure many of us are, are experiencing in our um, in our nations, uh, one is the way in which um, medical advice is being given. 
the fact that it can now be done remotely, not just through chat, not just through email, but also through uh, remote consultation. That's one example. There are some aspects of medical service that do require uh, physical presence, but actually uh, many that don't. So uh, that is quite a transformation, certainly in our health sector. Our legal systems, something that we all have, um, we all have very much in common uh, in our Commonwealth community, where uh, increasingly in the UK, certainly we're seeing many parts of the justice system, particularly in the civil side, being delivered uh, remotely. And, and that is a, um, uh, that really is quite a transformation. It makes uh, things uh, more efficient. It requires different ways of approaching things. My son is a barrister. He's just started his career in that. Um, he's only been in the, in, in the court a few, um, on, a few, uh, on a few occasions uh, since he qualified. Most of his hearings are done online. And my wife is a, um, uh, assists in teaching uh, and she is doing that remotely. So she's going into classes to um, support children, but also uh, doing remotely um, uh, classes uh, 500 miles away from, um, from where we live. So these are really remarkable um, uh, changes, which we definitely need to take through into, um, into the new world post pandemic, the world of the 21st century. Let me then um, add to that um, automation. Now, automation is something which uh, can seem intimidating to workforces. Uh, I think it's a, uh, it is actually better to think of it as a, a massively empowering opportunity, just the way that the, um, uh, the power hammer uh, replaced people hitting things with sledgehammers. Um, the uh, automation uh, provides the same type of reinforcement uh, of force uh, to uh, people's um, mental and organizational efforts. And if I give some practical examples of that, um, that we have in the UK that have always struck me when I've seen them and talked to colleagues who are working in public service uh, elsewhere in government. So one is um, the, uh, the prison officer. We have, we have a, a very interesting uh, spread of, uh, of prison estates in the UK. We have some uh, very old Victorian prisons and we have some very new uh, modern prisons. And it's interesting to see how much time for a prison officer is freed up in those modern prisons because many of the administrative tasks, taking orders about phone calls, meals, overseeing that type of thing can be done through kiosks rather than by um, people with pens and clipboards, prison officers with pens and clipboards. And that can free them to uh, the higher skill work of helping with rehabilit rehabilitation um, and development for uh, the people in custody. Similarly, uh, in our unemployment offices, um, we now are able to interact online with people we're helping to find employment. Uh, we have work coaches who uh, help with that in our, um, in our job centres uh, in the UK. And uh, it's great to see them being empowered to help their clients uh, in a much more um, practical, a much more real time uh, way. Because one of the other things the automation does, it allows us things to be done in, in, in much more uh, real time and rapid um, rapid forms of, uh, of interaction. Uh, so I think in all of those examples, uh, we're seeing something which one might describe as uh, taking the, uh, the robot out of the human. We're not basically replacing human tasks with robots uh, at, the, at, at the higher level. We're actually uh, enriching jobs through automation. And uh, that to me is a really important thing. But those are skills that we need to make sure are well imbued with, um, with everybody. Um, the next thing I want to mention was insight. Of course, I mentioned data as one of the enablers. Uh, we have um, access to much, uh, much richer forms of data and analysis, um, which uh, allows us to improve um, things tactically and also strategically to look for uh, to look for new solutions. And I think one of the things for, for me with that, which is a, a real challenge for both technology and uh, HR professionals, is not just how do we make sure we've got the right specialists, the right data scientists, the right technologists who can help build the databases and particularly glue the databases together that we have, but also how do we how do we train people in the sort of the baseline ability to be an intelligent client in the organisation of the data that they now have uh, they, they now have access to, uh, and that I think is a very real uh, capability challenge that we're looking at at the moment quite intensively in the UK civil service. Um, now, uh, there is a dark side to all technological development. And for us, probably one of the most uh, uh, important for, for all of us is 
uh, the risk of cyber threats um, uh, on that data. Uh, we're holding very precious data for our citizens. Uh, our services are very technologically dependent. Um, they are, uh, we are uh, at risk from cyber attack from both state actors and from um, uh, uh, criminal elements. And so cybersecurity becomes a, a very unifying and important thing for us to do. I, th I think one which increasingly, taking the analogy of the pandemic, uh, we should be thinking about epidemiologically. We should be thinking about how do we create cultures um, where not just the process and the technology uh, prevent it, but we have cultures which um, are very aware of the threats uh, and the issues uh, and the issues around data. And then um, linked to data also um, is the question of ethics um, underlying uh, everything we do in public service right back to our purpose is uh, the culture in which we operate, uh, the culture in which we provide those services and how do we make sure that we are really being true to the values that we all share through the Commonwealth and uh, in our um, in our democracies and uh, how do we respect um, uh, privacy uh, in that environment. Now this is really interesting for me uh, because as we set up systems we have lots of ways of interacting with that data and connecting the data um, across the piece. One of the issues for human resource professionals I believe that we're going to have to think about is what data do we want to hold what connections do we actually want to make? Um, one of my uh, enterprise architects came in to speak to me um, about uh, two years ago and said, Rupert, we can connect this and we can connect that. This is the capability that we now have in these ERPs. But could we just check what you want to connect and what you would rather keep separate? And those are uh, really important questions that I think we should be asking ourselves as we move into this new world and decide how we want to use and configure the capabilities. And configuration is the key here. How do we make sure that we're doing things in the best way to deliver our purpose, our strategies, facilitate the operating models, but make sure that the, the enablers, the data, the money, the people, the technology are configured um, in the best way that is safe and ethical and efficient and also the most fulfilling way it can be for the people working in that system. And that's what I wanted to finish on, which is uh, one of the things that really um, attracts me to this space, to the intersection of human resources and technology, which creates such um, leverage, is of those things I mentioned, money, people, technology, data, the people enabler is unique because the people who work for us in public service, the people who are our citizens as well, um, are, are sort of unique because unlike money or data or hardware or software, the people enabler in an organization is an end in itself, to quote Immanuel Kant. Um, people are ends, not just means. Every person working for us in public service is an individual who is a citizen and should be as fulfilled and kept as safe as possible. Um, and uh, that's a great and powerful uh, responsibility for all of us working in human resources in any organization, uh, certainly in public services uh, in the um, nations that we're part of. And uh, it's a great privilege uh, to do that. So I'm really excited to see uh, the agenda that's being discussed uh, today. Uh, thanks, Robert. Thank you very, very much, Rupert. Um, now, I'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A facility. We have a couple of minutes just to um, potentially present one or two questions. Um, Thank you very much. I've got a question, uh, Rupert, from uh, Mr. Ar Ahmed uh, Khanna. Now, it is technology would be would be of effective aid to HR in post-pandemic era, but but uh, uh, he's apprehensive about how HR professionals in poor developing countries would cope with the trend, considering the poor technology and ISP infrastructures that we have. Um, we also have a question from Arif Sarman who is from the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. And uh, his question is, to what extent does public service drive diversity in private and public sectors? I think if you could answer the first question, uh, sorry, the second question uh, first, because the first, the first one was more of a statement, I think, um, but you can certainly comment on that statement if you wish to. Yeah, well, I, I'm, it's a, thank you. Both both very great, uh, very great questions and uh, and comments. So on diversity and inclusion, I, I, I think that we have a huge role to play here. We, we set ourselves um, in the UK civil service, the objective of being uh, the most um, the most inclusive organisation in the in the UK. We sort of knew that that was a hard uh, objective to get to approve, but it drove our desire to um, to uh, to measure inclusion. 
Um, and we are also very attentive to the fact that as an organization, I think I believe any organization needs to reflect its customers. Uh, we need to reflect our citizenries and uh, that uh, needs to apply at every level from the most senior level uh, down to um, the people at the front line and uh, junior people as they join uh, our organizations. Um, I'm delighted to say that I think we've now um, in our most senior roles in government, permanent secretaries, uh, like I'm sure many of uh, many of colleagues on this call, um, I think we've just hit 18 uh, as a number of female permanent secretaries, which uh, takes us back to, I think we're back to, a, I think, almost an all time high um, and close to 50 percent. So uh, that's a great thing to see because uh, we should certainly represent um, uh, have, a, have the right gender balance. Uh, where we where we fare less well is in um, uh, in some some other aspects, whether it's colleagues with disabilities and senior roles, uh, or um, or colleagues uh, from um, uh, ethnic minorities in the UK. So those are all um, things that we're very focused on. Uh, again, the, the the world that we're in allows us to um, to track things much more, to analyze as we have done. I'd really encourage colleagues to do this to analyze our recruitment process to find out where in the process. Um, the uh, the lack of diversity is creeping in, um, and uh, and also, if I take that as an example for us in our graduate programs, we found that um, in many cases it was the least automated part of the system, the places where we had most human interaction, um, where we needed to really focus the uh, focus the attention to make sure that we were getting the right levels of um, of representation. So I completely agree; it's a very important uh, priority. Uh, for us and thing to keep in mind and a way of a way actually of turning into practical um, uh, application my point about humans being uh, ends not means uh, it's a good thing to good thing to focus on um, and I I take the first point as a, as a great statement I think that um, the technological barriers are dropping fast uh, now that we have um, for example apps and phones that allow us to do uh, to do more things um, but I think that um, Generally, everything I said should apply in any uh, any technological uh, any technological context, and uh, I'm sure that um, uh, well, it's it's important to look at what your technological base is. We're dealing with lots of legacy systems in the UK government that we need to that we need to respond to, um, and uh, I, I would um, uh, I, I would say that, that that's good. everything I've said has an impact regardless of the or um, of, of the technological context. Um, thank you very much, Rupert. I, I, I'd like just to finish by saying, um, you know, we've, we, we, I think it's very comforting to hear that the Chief People Officer of the UK government is focusing on so many different areas and taking security of data um, seriously, but also looking at the prism system and, and, look, and putting um, citizens uh, at the heart of the process and making sure that they're fulfilled. It's, uh, it's I think certainly a good opening for an HR and ICT forum. Um, I, um, hang on, sorry. Thank you. So I'd just I'd just, just like to finalise by saying the CTO has been honoured to have you attend this forum and it's been a privilege to listen to your discourse and we are very appreciative of the way you've, impart, you've imparted information about, as I said, sort of data protection, security, but also um, in, ensuring that there's an automa automation of systems across government. And um, that's, that is key, really, in, in making sure that we've got 21st century government. And, and, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's, and as you've mentioned, that you, you said that March last year really was when 21st century governance started and it's good to see that the UK is is coping in a, in a, in a very well in a, in, a, in a good way and 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 hopefully a good example for our members that are listening so thank you very much for your time today uh, I hope that you can have time to listen in but I understand that you're a very busy person if you do um, then that's wonderful but if not thank you very much for your time today and uh, we look forward to hopefully continuing this discussion with you in in further meetings thank you thanks Robert thank you so our next session is session one, and it's the future of work in the Commonwealth, and it's chaired by Mr. Usman Maman. Mr. Usman Maman is the head of the Human Capital Department of the Nigerian Communications Commission. He is a seasoned economist and well-grounded in telecommunication with over 30 years experience spanning banking, telecommunication, licensing, and human resources management. And if I can please ask Mr. Usman to um, take the stage, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would 
like to welcome you all once again to the first session of the 2021 Human Resource ICT Forum. Now the team understanding the new digital normal, fostering organizational readiness in the 21st century could not be more apt. You know, the topic for discussion this morning is the future of work in the Commonwealth. Um, as the previous speakers rightly pointed out, advancement in technology, demographic changes, and also the COVID-19 pandemic has have been a catalyst for change in many aspects of our lives, including how we view work and the workplace. You know, the disruption caused by the pandemic has forced all countries in the Commonwealth, regardless of their development status, to reconsider the traditional views of human capital management and work management as well. Um, I recently read an article on Deloitte's website, which defined the future of work in terms of three deeply connected dimensions of an organization. The work itself, who does the work and where work is done. And to understand the future of work in the Commonwealth, we have to answer questions that arise relating to these dimensions. Questions such as what work can be automated, who can do the work, and where is the work done? So in this session, we will explore the trends, challenges, and opportunities of the new normal and what this means for HR uh, practitioners. Um, for trends, of course, we are witnessing trends around remote work and flexible work hours, focus on job delivery, online meetings, virtual learning, and preference for employees' individual skills rather than you know, advanced uh, degrees. In terms of challenges, Within the common context of the Commonwealth countries, we see this being associated with availability of internet, I mean, reliable and fast internet access, connectivity and devices, you know, collaboration and security of the connections, and of course, willingness of employers to allow for remote work and a host of other, you know, challenges. Now, all this means for HR practitioners is that there is need to embrace these changes, most of which are not reversible. There is a need to go back to the drawing board to ensure the work environment has a focus and flexible performance base and even bigger focus on employee wellness and work-life uh, balance. That being said, let us proceed with the next item on the agenda. That's a 15 minute presentation by Mr. Ian Blankert. And here, Mr. Ian Blankert is a mentor and a coach to growth minded leaders and business owners. As founder and managing director of the Caribbean Institute of Leadership and Coaching at the CILC, he works with corporate leaders and business owners, helping them to grow themselves and the organizations. He will talk about the topic rethinking work and the HR function, after which we will go straight into the panel discussion. Mr. Ba Mr. Blankert, you are welcome. Thank you, Usman, really appreciate it. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here and, and I wanna thank Secretary General for, for inviting me and for the CTO to have me as a presenter. Now. Let me tell you a story first, because when I think about rethinking work, rethinking the HR function, I, I remember some significant moments in, in my own life. And the dates um, go through from December 27th, 1990. Uh, if I go back to 1984, if I go forward to, to 1995, I go forward again to 2007. Now, the reason these are significant is because for each of those moments, I had to rethink. I had to reassess my current state of thinking and change my approach. So rethinking is not just a matter of, I am thinking something different, but when I think something different, I must 
do something different. So I want to share with you a, a, a short presentation um, on how do we rethink work and what are the implications of not rethinking work as I share with you my own experience of rethinking my own work. Now, if I go back to my, my, natural, my natural style, my natural style is one where more people are oriented, but I studied engineering, I studied telecommunications, worked in telecommunications for over 25 years. And I wondered, I'm not a natural engineer, to be honest with you, I studied engineering, but engineering is not something that's natural to me. I am more people oriented. So I began to recognize as I grew older that the technology foundation really cemented for me the ability to be able to utilize technology for building capacity. And one of the things that, that, that we will recognize is that if we are not able to leverage technology we are going to struggle. So let me share with you a story of two of my children. Ayana is 25. She's a doctor, she's a pediatrician. Michael is 13 and now entering primary school, a secondary, sorry, he's now in for primary school. Now, one of the things that I've recognized that there are similarities about Michael and, and Michael and Ayana, and there are differences about Michael and Ayana. I go back to Ayana being three years old, we're in the Cayman Islands and she's jumping on the bed and I'm, I'm trying to make sure she's protected. As Ayana grew, I had to rethink my approach to protecting her. And organizations in this economy, in this current a scheme of things must begin to not just rethink, but respond. And do not someone can give me access to be able to share my screen? What I wanted to share with you is a couple impacts of the current environment. So let me, let me share a few of them with you as I, as I continue my story. Because my story as a father with Michael and Ayano and rethinking my approach based on, first of all, I got married, then when I joined Cable and Wireless, then when I, 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 I was born and we launched internet in Dominica going back in, in 1995. There is thinking and the convergence of building capacity and technology was something that was critical to, first of all, my ability to continue to manage my family because it was, it was important. Now, when I look at the impact of technology, then look at the impact of the different generations in the workplace, then look at the social implications and the changes in the societal structures, and then obviously the COVID pandemic. So I look at these four things and recognize that they each have implications for organizations as far as organizational leadership, organizational culture, employee engagement, and the operating models of organization. So we have external factors bearing in on organizations that's going to change or has changed the way work is viewed and the way work is, work is actually performed. So when I think about how I function with Ayana and how I function with Michael, they are two different personalities and therefore my approach to them must be different. So when I look at again organizational culture, organization, employee engagement, when I look at organizational leadership, when I look at organizational models in terms of the operating structure, I ask myself, what does HR need to do in rethinking the way HR functions? And, and I want to look at four things that the, the changes in the technological space, in the, the, the medical space in terms of COVID, in terms of the transgenerational nature in the workplace and the societal changes and how organizational structures, how organizational leadership, how organizational engagement of its people needs to change to ensure by an actual fact we can be building capacity. 
Usman mentioned a short while ago the whole concept of, and I don't want to say the move away, but the reality that while we need degrees, and I've got an MBA, so I, I don't want to suggest that 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 structured degrees are unimportant, but skill sets and the building of skill sets that are usable in the workplace are essential to ensuring that we are able to apply principles, not just learn theory. And the capacity building um, space needs to think through how do we ensure that that happens. So let's look at what I call the rethinking, the, the rethinking of HR as we think about how, what are HR leaders need to do in terms of rethinking the HR space. And the first thing I want you to think about is the whole idea of HR leadership. Now, as an HR leader, the question is your current, how does your current model need to change? What I tend to see over the years is you have HR managers that are extremely strong and are extremely um, in control of, of, of what is going on within the organization from a people standpoint. And then you have HR directors or managers who are more administrative based. So you have these two contrasts. And I would like to suggest that none of these are correct. HR managers need to rethink their leadership model where they need to understand that their ability to facilitate and to pass on and be a consultant and a partner to the managers within the organization so that they can manage their people is essential. So from a leadership standpoint, HR managers must be a, a partner and at the table at the C-suite, but must understand that their role is to facilitate managers, leaders, supervisors, ability to manage their people. So HR managers must change and must rethink from a perspective of leadership. The next thing I want to think about is the perspective of employee engagement. Now, employee engagement <laughs> is something that is, is, is elusive. It's something that a lot of us sometimes we measure you know, once and then the next three years, and we don't do it consistently. But we all know, and it's been proven, that, that engaged employees perform at a much better rate. Now, technology is changing, and COVID has changed, and which means that Employees are no longer required to be in the office. And managers all times perspective of, I must see you to believe that you're working has fundamentally been shattered. It means, for example, that HR managers must help managers understand that this type of model is something that is going to continue into the future and therefore they must review the way they engage employees. I'll give you a simple example. Employees must work from home, which means they must have stable internet connections. Employees must work from home, which means that they must be able to have a network at home that gives them the ability to connect all the time. Now, unlike me, I have an engineering background, so therefore I can set up my own home network to, to most of, to, to, in terms of most of the things. But HR must understand that engaging employees would mean, for example, getting involved in helping employees set up their home networks. Not necessarily by doing it for them, but being able to facilitate, maybe by giving loans, maybe by providing IT support from the organization, maybe by doing training courses. So that type of engagement has to be different. The way that we build teams have to change because people are remote and people are functioning differently. So employee engagement is different. The first thing I want us to think about is the whole idea of the role of the HR manager at the executive table. So you as the HR manager must be able to have a conversation around business growth. You must be able to have a conversation around how each of the individual members of the executive team function because you as the HR practitioner, as the HR strategic partner, must be in a position to be able to build capacity, not just below your level, but across the organization. It means you must understand what your colleagues are dealing with going through and be able to understand how you can support and build their capacity without feeling that you must come into the HR, to the C-suite meeting putting on an HR hat. You must put on an organizational hat to be able 
to review and to be able to support your HR, your, your other colleagues within the C-suite. And the fourth thing that HR managers, I believe, must do in terms of the HR function is, the, is to relook at the whole idea of capacity building and human resource development. If you don't develop your people, then you are stagnating the organization. And I'm not just thinking about a single row of skills. I'm talking about a broader range of skills. And, and for me, the whole idea of ability to be aware and be emotionally connected is important. So let me share a simple model with you that as I close to be able to explain to you what you need to think about. You need to think about at the base, what is in it for me? What I mean for me, I don't mean for you as the HR manager, but for the, each individual within the organization. Others only learn when something is in it for them. So you must be able to present something that says what's in it for me so they must understand that. Then the issue of self-awareness. If I'm not aware of myself, it doesn't matter what training you lay on top of that is going to crumble. The foundation of any training program, any capacity building program starts with self-awareness. It then goes to mindset. It then goes to the way we think and the way we perceive things and how we should look at things. It then moves to training, coaching, and application. Because training on its own, I'm sure you've seen, hasn't quite worked. You must infuse that with coaching and mentoring. And then with the application of that through projects, through special assignments. And then there must be a layer of tracking and accountability. Many times we send people to training, but nothing follows. We do not have the manager, the supervisor, or the leader of that unit tracking and monitoring and facilitating the, the assurance that these skills are utilized within the organization. So in closing, I just want to say to you as HR practitioners, you need to think about the changing and the rethinking of your function in terms of your leadership, in terms of employee engagement, in terms of how you sit on the C-suite, and in terms of how you build human capacity within your organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Blankert, for, I mean, a wonderful insight as to, you know, how HR can manage, you know, this change. Definitely the change has come and it has come to stay. I mean, you've mentioned very vital points, which I believe uh, practitioners would find very useful in the course of, you know, the change we are faced with. And the next um, speakers, uh, in no order of, uh, you know, whatever, I'm trying to introduce Mr. Rohan Makala. Mr. Rohan Makala is the Director of Human Resource and Administration at the Office of Utilities Regulation, OR, OUR. Before joining the OUR, he worked as Chief Records Officer at the Financial Services Commission. He, also, he is also Senior Adjunct Lecturer in Mixed Methods Research at the University of West Indies, Mona. And the next uh, discussant here is uh, Dr. Leah Maka. Dr. Leah Maka is the Chief Executive Officer of the Public Service Commission of the Kingdom of Tonga. Dr. Maka has led implementation of major public service reform programs, most notably the implementation of the new remuneration structure and new performance management system. Now, these two discussions will throw more light on, you know, the future of work and, of course, the paper presented by Mr. Ian Blankert. Panelists, discussant, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Chair. Morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. So I smiled when I heard Ian speaking just now because a lot of the points that he raised actually had me reflecting. And so my task here is to talk about how HR professionals can foster and support greater employee engagement and productivity in this era of increasing digital work. And in preparing for this presentation, I 
thought of going back to the Gallup study to look at where things are in terms of the reported employee engagement. And what I found was that the report suggests that 15% of employees across the world are engaged. And I questioned myself what happened or what's happening to the other percentage. The report went on to say that 35% of employees in the US are engaged. And I, I also questioned, I looked a little bit more at my own country and we have an entity called the Jamaica Business Development Corporation, the JBDC, that puts out a annual survey or report about in employee engagement. In fact, there is an annual conference on employee engagement that happens every year. And the JBDC is actually reporting that one in four Jamaicans are engaged. And uh, Jamaica is uh, one of the lowest in the Caribbean region in terms of product productivity. And as my research knowledge would actually tell me or inform, there is a positive correlation between uh, employee engagement and productivity. So both work in the same direction. So when, product, when employee engagement increases, then ultimately all being with other factors impacting productivity would also increase. And looking through these research reports, I've had to question myself as an HR professional and also think about our own profession in terms of what do we need to do in this era to, to enhance or to improve these numbers in terms of employee engagement. And also to question what have we not been doing right. And so again, Ian's presentation really made a lot of things jump out on me. Because for me, I think this whole idea of our construct of employee engagement, there's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all. In a number of instances, it is contextual. And the, in this environment that we're existing in with this pandemic, it makes it even greater for us to reflect on what exactly do we do. So in thinking through, th through this presentation, I thought of the fact that as HR practitioners, we have to start to think about how we help people and help people to understand that Though the whole idea of employee engagement is really looking at workers, employees, how involved they are, how enthusiastic they are about their work, how empowered they are, how committed they are to their work and their workplaces. It starts with us. There are persons who are intrinsically motivated and they will do things and not think about how others perceive them, how others recognize them. And there are others who will want to hear that I'm doing a good job, would want to be re re rewarded. And it doesn't have to be financial rewards. We'll want those communication, we'll want those relationships. And so the question on the table is, how do we as HR professionals help in this, in this regard? How do we find ourselves at the table, that C-suite table? How do we contribute? How do we make that bridge between that C-suite leadership and just about anybody within the organization? And so in further reflection, I have had to think that relationships do matter. The relationships that we form with every single person in our organization and by extension, our stakeholders do matter in this process of employee engagement. I also think our, our emotions do matter. And, and Ian touched on it just now in terms of, you know, how it is that we're going to manage our emotions. And I would want to strengthen that in terms of how it is that us as HR practitioners must manage our emotions, must regulate our emotions, and then to help others to manage and regulate those emotions. Again, in this dispensation that we're existing in the pandemic. 
there are persons now who are struggling working from home, really just trying to maneuver the technologies, understanding what it means to work from home. Am I, are my outputs as good enough? Am I being recognized for the efforts that I'm making, that I'm putting out? And so I think we have that responsibility to help or supervisors or managers or leaders or staff to understand how to navigate this current situation to have people understand that they are empowered to do some of the things that they need to do. There are persons who have yet shifted their mindset from you know, how it is that we are going to measure work in this dispensation and so a, a thought and a message that I also have is that we have to change the way that we think about performance and assessment. And so we've always stuck in this mode of thinking about performance management. And at intervals, we may evaluate and give feedback in probably a very structured and, and stuff way. But I think we're gonna have to change that dispensation and think how it is that we give on the spot, on demand, feedback to people. Have them understand what they are doing right and how it is that they can improve in what they are not doing as right. We're gonna to have to express a lot of gratitude. And it's one of the things that I see, you know, we don't do all the time, express gratitude. And it may be simple gratitude for the effort people are making in this time. And things like these, I think, will help people to understand that they are valued to an organization. Their work and work is valued. So for me in my organization, I've started to think through from the very early onset in terms of talent acquisition. So when I do interviews, for example, what type of interviews do I do? And I find myself looking at doing interviews in terms of values-based interviews and also employee engagement interviews. So I ask people questions, for example, what are some of the things that motivate you in an organization? What are some of the things that you'd like to see from leadership? What are some of the things that you'd like to see from your colleagues? And so those things give me a sense of how do I prepare for this employee? who we're taking on? How do we em em onboard this employee? How do we continue to see the development of this, this employee throughout this, this, this employee's work life? Ian spoke about development and I'm also big on development because that too is going to help us to engage and continue to re-engage the employees in this dispens dispensation. Thinking through about engaging younger persons with talents that we need in the organization, I think is also going to be very important because what it says, it sends a message that we care about people, we believe in people, we value the contributions, we want to empower people. Trust is going to also be an important ingredient. And so it's not only about Thing, but I think it's, it's, it's about doing as well because some of the times our words do not correlate with the things that we do. And so my charge or my, 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 what I'm throwing out today is even as leaders and just managers in our organizations, we have to think about walking the walk and talking the talk. So the two things can't be different. The things that we do have to be incongruent, would be, would, has to be congruent with the things that we, that we say. And so at this time, I, I, I want to stop here to, to hand over to my other discussion uh, yeah. to, to, to further the point. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Rohan. We invite uh, Dr. Leah Maka. And please, uh, discussion should take note that you have five minutes for this discussion because the time is up. Thank you, Dr. Lea, you're welcome. Thank you, Chairman uh, Osman. Malo Lele, greetings from Tonga. 
Uh, this presentation is more about a, a status report, a rather general status report uh, than me talking about a specific strategy on shifts in, in operating HR models. And, um, and, and there, there's a reason why I'm focusing uh, on, this, on this very general uh, status update. Uh, the Kingdom of Tonga has a very small population of about 110,000 people. And it's located in the Southwest Pacific, about three hours flight from Auckland, New Zealand, and one hour flight from Fiji. Tonga is still one of the very few countries in the world that has not recorded any COVID-19 cases. However, the closures of international borders from last year led to our borders also being closed. Uh, and there was a temporary lockdown uh, to stay at home uh, curfews in government operations, and that has been ongoing. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we have heard and noted, has elevated the role of technology in the workplace and likewise has accelerated investments in technology in all sectors and spheres of the workplace and in everyday life. We hear from our sisters and brothers and those agencies in developed countries of their wide use of the HR technologies. Much of those are already mainstreamed. Then that appears to be the norm uh, and it seems to be the norm for a number of investment in, in cloud deployed human capital management or HCM for short, uh, for administrative HR and talent management. And we've, we've just had examples from our colleagues from uh, 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 the UK talking about it. But yes, uh, this appears to be the norm, but uh, this is very much on the surface in the Kingdom of Tonga. We're still at the doorway of this digital space. Uh, the emerging HR technologies, which are becoming quite popular, such as virtual assistance in HCM, and in particular, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, internal talent marketplace, as has been just discussed, employee productivity monitoring, as has been discussed, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, matters, as has been referred to uh, in the first speaker. Blockchain and augmented reality and this virtual reality uh, applications, these are already being introduced and used across a lot of global organizations. But this is not the case in Tonga and for much of these technologies. And, and I think I can speak for probably many of my Pacific Island government uh, neighbors uh, around the Pacific. However, to utilize these technologies carries several assumptions for the government of Tonga. Uh, there are five of them. First, the investments, uh, there has to be some investments already made on equipment, uh, software, and the support infrastructure. Second, there has to be connectivity, capability, uh, and bandwidth uh, that are reliable to be in place. Third, there has to be guidelines to map out the various processes and pro procedures for events that need to be in place. Fourth, staff need to be already trained in the use of these technologies. And five, I think this is also very important, there has to be some alignment and technology responsive legislations and employment laws for these things to happen. All of these five assumptions, they fall short of being fully realized in Tonga. For example, investments on machines, software and support infrastructure. Three quarters of our public servants and in the government, they're using personal computers and videos 
Uh, and also about three quarters of the 5,000 plus public service have personal smartphones. However, mainstream daily business in the digital sense is limited to using of the Microsoft apps for communications, including me, emails and, and the social media. The use of things such as uh, virtual assistants, chat box, virtual reality, that has just emerged. And this is still being used on an exploratory ad hoc basis not that mainstream as I've said before. Some of the software applications, uh, virtual assistance, for example, is of great interest to us here in the public service because of their potential to save significant processing time and cost by automating high volume and low complex HCM processes and freeing up time for our HR managers to focus on more higher level uh, work. And we hope to explore and tap into this more. The connectivity capability in Tonga is limited. We are still only in the rural areas, we are running on a bandwidth uh, 4G, and the rest of the country is 3G. So that has major implications on being digitally prepared. Three guidelines on different procedures on working remotely or working in virtual reality. These are not yet in place, but we, we, are, we are learning from other areas, from other governments who are supporting us in providing guidelines and guidance on how to do a number of things and follow things uh, working remotely like this. Four, capability of our staff in Tonga, there are only 148 staff working in the ICT area. And of these, only less than 50% are trained professional uh, ICTs. Um, there is a huge implication for training and upskilling in the relevant area, as has been identified by Mr. McCullough. And then uh, lastly, in our current Public Service Act, there is no reference at all to the word digital. So we need to also look at other legislations, uh, particularly the employment relations uh, laws, where there may be a need to make sure that the laws fully support using digital platforms. I think to, to sum up in terms of digital readiness, Tonga is not that prepared in a global sense. We are still in the fringes, but COVID-19, as has been mentioned by the SG in their opening remarks, has catapulted uh, us, has galvanized us to look at working using different operating uh, models uh, because the future is pretty much unknown as is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lea. And uh, we have actually got insights from, you know, uh, the different speakers. If threw more light on a number of issues, particularly, of course, technology being an enabler is very, very important. And then, of course, leadership provided by, of course, the HR practitioners is also very, very key in era of change because leadership must be provided to enable you know, the change as well. And the uh, issues of engagement of employers and a host of other very germane issues mentioned here are very, very uh, critical. So at this uh, juncture, I would like to open um, you know, the forum for, for questions. And uh, of course, Participants from all walks of life, can you use the question and answer you know, button to send their questions? And so the forum is open for questions based on the presentations by the panelists. Thank you. Sorry, Secretariat, do we have uh, questions? Oh, thank you, Usman. Sorry, I can certainly. Um read a couple of questions out if you'd like. Um, 
So we've, our first question, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement, let me just check. The promotion of, it's by Elevi um, Mine, and it's the promotion of HR management to the board puts HR under the strict influence of the board's culture and of its conditions of collaboration, enabling any moral disengagement processes that may be happening that, be, that can be enacted on the persons administered by the HR function. How can this be prevented? Um, it's, it's on your screens. If you want to just look into the Q&A, you can read it as well. Just to, I'm not sure if I, if I captured it in, 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 in its essence in, in the way I read it, but I hope that, that you understood that. And secondly, we have HR issues that are difficult and these days to be managed more so in government institutions or government um, parastatals. Um, for private institutions, they can be easily managed. How are the issues managed in government institutions? But um, what also, I, if, if, if these questions, of course, can be answered. But I, I would also encourage you to have conversations between the three, the four of you, um, and and have a free, free, free flowing discussion on, on some of the things that you've discussed. Um, there was certainly some very interesting content that came out of out, out of what was said, and I'm sure you have questions for each other. Um, so please please use this time to, to to ask questions to each other too. Thank you. Okay. Um... I believe the, quest, the first uh, question on the, on, the, on the platform is about, you know, being HR being a, a business partner. You know, the questioner is probably, you know, apprehensive of HR being, uh, you know, probably controlled by the board. But I believe, uh, you know, the practice of HR nowadays calls for HR being recognized as a business partner. The HR needs to have a good understanding of, you know, the business of, 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 of the organization so as to enable, you know, the provision of the required, you know, manpower, you know, advice and so on and so forth. So the practice nowadays is for HR to actually be recognized as part of the board so as, you know, for the organization to deliver on its own, uh, you know, goals and objectives. Um, of course, other discussion can also, you know, you know, say a few or one or two things about uh, HR uh, being a business uh, partner. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Osman. So yeah. for me, in terms of the HR being under the influence of the board, I would like to suggest that instead of HR thinking about just how the board influences HR. I want HR to step up and say, how do we influence the board? Because boards are, are, are required to protect an organization. Boards are required to make sure that the organization is able to provide the financial stability and manage the risk on the organization and the risk of the, of the actual investors. Now, HR to me is, 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 is uniquely positioned, sitting at the board level, to be able to speak to those issues because a lot of times, because we cannot put people on the balance sheet, because it is difficult sometimes to measure some of the people issues, I think HR practitioners need to find a way to begin to now put numbers to the improvements in people and behavior and attitudes. Because if that is done, then the board will listen, the board will pay attention. So HR practitioners have to take the time to, to begin to, how do we get data to support what we are doing with people? For example, I'll give you an example, training. Many HR managers organize training, but no measurement is done on the impact of that training. So when you come back next year, the budget is cut because you haven't shown the actual benefit of that training. So HR managers must be able to look at the training that they've done, the improvement they have seen, both in behavior and performance, and track it consistently over time to be able to present that to the board, to be able to influence the board, rather than to be fearful of the board influencing them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ian. Um, Mr. Rohan, do you have any, do you have a view on this? I do, I do, I do. So my, my take on it is that some of the times us as the HR practitioners may not necessarily attend the meetings of the board, but we can actually speak with our executive directors or CEOs, those persons who actually go to the board meeting. So in my case, I do not go to the board meeting, but my director general goes. 
And so I inform him of what's happening and the language to speak and how to answer certain questions that are asked of him in terms of what's happening in human resource in the organization. We have a subcommittee of the board which focuses on HR, which I also am a part of. And so whenever I go to those meetings, I ensure that I have them understand what's happening. So that's a take I'd want to, to, to put on that one. For the second point, I sure understand it's not easy in terms of looking at you know, for private sector, public sector, government. But what I'd say, as I just said in my presentation, it's not a silver bullet. And we as HR practitioners have to start to think about what are the small steps that we will take. So something as simple as engaging persons, having people understand that you are there, you care for them, you show gratitude, for example, for the things that they do are simple steps. Thank you, Rohan. Um, um, Dr. Lea, what's your experience you know, in Tonga on you know, this, uh, this question about HR being a business partner? Do you agree with the previous uh, you know, you know, you know, answers or you have a different view? Just let's have your own view, thank you. Yes, I, I do agree with what has been uh, voiced uh, by, by Mekala. Uh, I, I, I do not, uh, I, I, I think I cannot explain the Tongan process, but it, it, it actually aligns with what Mekala is saying. Is this about HR management being part of the board? Are you there? So it seems we've lost, uh, you know, Dr. Micah. And let me go to the next question I have. Um, you know, the role of connectivity and devices in ensuring an effective, you know, future of work cannot be overemphasized. You know, given the varying degrees of advancement of the Commonwealth uh, countries in terms of technology adoption, um, what do you think are the basic things required, particularly for the least uh, developed countries to, you know, initiate as part of the process of adopting the future of our work? I, I think from, from, from me, from where I sit and just looking through, uh, it, is, it is a challenge. And even for us as a regulator, I know we've, we've lobbied, for example, or we've been talking to the, the internet service providers, for example. We, we have somewhat a good uh, you know, landscape in terms of technology, but We've seen, for example, the challenge in our education system and also in, in work. So now people complain about bandwidth and not being able to you know, have all the facilities that they need. And the, the, the point is that there is probably no simple answer you know, right now. And so what I, what I probably want organizations to start to think about is how do you start incrementally the small things uh, that you can do and have the conversations at different levels because different stakeholders surely are, are a part of it. For some people, they haven't yet thought about what it is that they will need to bring them into the future uh, uh, of, of a, you know, stronger work and stuff. So I think even just starting to think through what exactly do we need how much it will cost, for example, over what time frame you need some of these things are going to be important. But for the foreign space, I don't think I have an answer right now. Okay. Um, any any other view? Yeah. In, in terms of technology, uh, I, I have two perspectives. Um, the first is that 
there is a requirement for for better online infrastructure. I mean, I, I have absolutely no doubt of that. I mean, I was involved in the initial launch of Internet in Dominica going back in, in, in 1995. But what I think that we have to change is the flow of information. Let me, let me, let me explain a little bit. What we do, we download a lot of content into our countries. And I think it is time we begin to flip the switch a little bit and begin to create more content. So we have that, first of all, we will have better utilization of bandwidth within country because we will have more content for people to absorb and to, to, to be relevant to us. But secondly, we have the ability for the international market to be able to download content coming from our countries. So I think, you know, one of the things that I think we have to encourage into our school system is the ability to create content, get into, it, get into information type products and be in a position that we can actually get our heads outside of our individual countries to be able to have more of a global impact. Because I think the talent and capacity in our countries is huge. But that is not realized because we find that the bandwidth we use comes down to us rather than upwards, because I think we have enough capacity and enough talent to be able to provide bandwidth to the globe, but we don't take enough time in terms of building the capacity locally and both from a technological standpoint and from a human capital standpoint to be able to influence the world. And I think that's something we need to think about and do more. Great. Um, doctor? Seems we've uh, lost uh, Dr. Maka. Um, well, that brings me to the next question, which is uh, we've already alluded to the fact that you know technology has come to stay, and technology has a way of influencing a lot of things around us. In fact, some people say technology or things like broadband has become an all-purpose vehicle, where virtually every sector relies on you know technology, and there is a perspective from the organized labor. And of course the organized, organized labor is uh, a bit apprehensive. I mean, they are of course suggesting the adoption of future work with a human face. We all know what automation is. Technology is about automation. And organized labor is advocating for adoption of future work with a human uh, face. They are advocating for increase in investment on workforce increase in investment on workplace and things like uh, job retention. You know, I tell you my personal experience and um, some decades ago when I joined the banking industry, you know, the bank I joined just got fully automated. And so some people found themselves in a very difficult situation that they couldn't cope with the automation, they had to leave. Others that were ready to upskill and reskill were, were retained. Eventually, of course, those who couldn't perform had to be laid off. And so these are some of the apprehensions, you know, by, by, by the organization, I mean, by organized labor, for instance. In your own opinion, what are some of the best approaches to be adopted by organization to assuage the apprehensions of organized, I mean, organized uh, labor, particularly on uh, job loss? Go ahead, Ron, go ahead. Uh, Chair, you know, I reflected on that and digital literacy is, is on my tongue because, and I think HR practitioners have a role to play in, in that. I'm an educator as well as an HR professional and, I, and I'm thinking, so in my country, for example, there is a lot of what I consider misuse of some of the technologies that we had and Ian just spoke about the downloading you know you know phenomena and so our young people tend to to to, to misuse a lot of the technologies so for example we have this thing in our school called tablets in schools and what the report actually found was that the tablets were issued but the students were using them for the wrong means mm -hmm. I, I'm going to make that link because as HR practitioners we have that role to help, for example, our employees to have their children, for example, understand what is, is, is expected of them in terms of work and the changes that are happening in work and the dynamism of the environment in which they're going to come into 
when they grow into adults to work. And so I think the mindset has to be changed in terms of how we're going to use technologies, how we're going to embrace technologies. And I always say to my students, for example, and my employees, it is going to become an environment of the fittest of the fit. And so that for me answers the point that you're making. We're going to have to change how it is that we see work, how it is that we prepare ourselves to work, how it is that we prepare our next generation for work, because I think we're misusing the technologies that we have, which are could be to our, to our advantage. Thank you. Ian, any view on this? Yeah, Chair, Chair I, was, I was thinking about, as, 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 as you spoke about the loss of jobs coming from the lack of uh, adaptation of technology or, or, or people not willing or unable to, to make transitions. And one of the things I want to suggest is, is, is for us is to think about how do we encourage content creation? Let me, let me explain. In every organization, there are, and every country, there are people who are good in specific things. So what we have to do is, for example, there are people who are good at adaptation to IT. Encourage them to produce a video course on ad IT adaptation, use of Excel, that is in a local language, that, that is, is something that local people can consume. So, so Dr. Marker, for example, if you can hear me, you have a, a small percentage of IT people. Get them to produce IT training locally, right? And, and that gives them the capacity, one, to earn an income if you want. The government can earn an income depending on who, how you want to structure it. But what it does, it, 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 it builds the capacity of the organization or of the country. So you are able now to spread that knowledge and be in a position where you have people who are not just theoretically inclined, but are practically skilled to be able to function and develop nationally. So, I mean, we've just, you know, we've, we've gone into a, we've created an online platform in terms of our training platform over the last uh, year and a half. And it took a lot of learning from me. I mean, I have, I have an IT back uh, and a technology background, but I think we, we are missing the opportunity to take the people that we have who have capacity and ability and give them a global platform by helping them to create content based on the skills that they have so they can build their organizations and build our nations. Yeah. Now, thank you very much for all the insights. I understand we've, uh, we are running out of time. And so it is time for us to really wrap up. But I also want to point out a very important issue here is, because what is the role of uh, you know, the CTO, I mean, the secretariat in terms of providing you know, awareness to the Commonwealth countries, as well as you know, providing training interventions for you know, things uh, like, I mean, the future of work. I believe this should provide a great opportunity for the CTO secretariat to think and come up with very you know, innovative you know, intervention in terms of training, development and some other interventions for the seat, I mean, for the Commonwealth uh, uh, countries, so as to bring them up to speed. I know technology is a function of, you know, the level of development of a country, but then there are certain things that can be adopted. And I want to encourage, um, you know, the CTO to really think and come up with some innovative interventions to be provided to, you know, the Commonwealth uh, uh, countries, so as to, you know, bring them up to speed in terms of uh, future work. Um, on that note, I don't know, Robert, do we still have more time? I, I, I don't know whether Dr. Leah Maka is able to say one line, uh, well, uh, one minute of, of, of just as, uh, before she goes. Um, uh, Dr. Maka, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I think this has been very useful. I, I fully support what uh, Ian Blanchard has said about encouraging our employees to create content uh, I think that's one way of uh, engaging our employees, particularly in ICT, uh, but also developing their capabilities uh, at the same time. And, and, and that should actually uh, 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 engender ownership about the whole process of shifting the work uh, dynamics and the work modality into what we want to do now 
into a digital space. Thank you. Thank you. And, and before you all go, the Secretary General um, would like to just to say a, a, a few comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair um, Usman. Thank you. I, I just want to reiterate that the CTO is committed to raising awareness and educating and opening the eyes of our members and stakeholders of the importance and what they can do locally. Yes, uh, there is no shortage of intellectual uh, capacity in our countries and we have to capitalize on those skills that are indigenous. And as Ian said, create the content that is relevant and relatable in our environments. Yes, and that is something that we are very, very firm about, that we want to develop the indigenous talents of our people so that we could we relate uh, and we can contribute in our environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, SG. So um, thank you very much to um, Joe Rosman and thank you very much to Ian Rohan and Dr. Maka for a fantastic uh, opening session. And um, we've really enjoyed that very much. There's lots to be done, as you said, and, 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 um, and, and CTO is here to support and this can be discussed throughout the conference. So please stay, stay online and we can have that discussion and that can be continued. In, in, in the next sessions. So um, that leads me to introduce you, uh, sorry, I, that, that leads me to introduce session two, which is integrated approaches to capacity building for operational effectiveness. And I'm going to introduce the chair of this session, which he, and, and this is, he's a, a longtime supporter of CTO, as is his organization. And it's Mr. Juma Kandi. And Mr. Juma Kandi is a distinguished HR professional with extensive leadership and management experience gained in the last 28 years spanning across ICT, development, academia, and finance sectors. Um, and um, he has been part of the leadership team at the Communications Authority of Kenya for the last 18 years, responsible for the human capital and administration function. So um, over to you, Juma, and um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for the introduction. I would like to welcome all the distinguished uh, delegates. Good afternoon for the delegates who are within the afternoon hours. Good morning to our delegates in uh, the Atlantic. And uh, good evening for the delegates on the Eastern side. Uh, this session uh, is focusing on integrated approach to capacity building. And uh, I just want to draw some of the issues that have come up today, which actually build on uh, the session. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the chairman of the previous session, uh, the speaker and the panelists, because they have touched a lot on the issues that we are going to discuss on this session. The SG at the beginning, actually highlighted some of the issues, particularly the issue of individual security uh, during this time of the COVID pandemic. When you have individual employees feeling insecure, then they will not be productive. And also she brought up the issue of the new normal and the way we need to rethink afresh because what worked yesterday may not work today and definitely will not work tomorrow. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we going to do so that we can be more productive and uh, our organizations can be effective in delivery of services and also in uh, being sustainable. One of the issues the chief, uh, the guest speaker talked about, uh, Mr. McNeil, was on uh, enablers. They particularly highlighted the, the critical role that people play as enablers. And again, it ties into the whole issue that if the critical enablers are feeling insecure, it becomes a challenge for them to deliver, be it in the public service or in the private sector. So that means we still have to focus particularly on the people element of the business. And the Ian talked about a very important issue, the issue of HR being at the table and not on the table. 
So that means HR has to understand the entire business. They have to focus on what is happening today, what is likely to happen tomorrow, and how do we pre prepare the people for the tomorrow that we are focusing on. So all that brings us to now the whole idea of an integrated approach, acknowledging that no one way will be successful. We will have to adapt a multi-pronged approach so that we are able to deal with the challenges and prepare ourselves for tomorrow. In this session, we have uh, distinguished uh, speakers. We have uh, Mr. Bevil Hooding, who will be leading us with a presentation. He will uh, take the first 15 minutes. After that, we will have um, Lara Page, who will uh, take us through, make a presentation of five minutes, uh, make, taking us through some of the issues that are coming up in rethinking capacity building in this century. Then we have Hannah, who, will also, who is also a panelist, who will take us through on some of the things we need to do in rethinking about capacity building in this century and in preparing for the years to come. May I now take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Mr. Bevil Hooding. Uh, Mr. Bevil Hooding is a director at Caribbean Affairs with the American Registry of Internet Numbers. He's also a facilitator of the Caribbean Network Operators Group and one of the leading voices in the region in promoting the use of ICT in socioeconomic development. He is well experienced and he has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. I will give him the first 15 minutes. Then after that, I will introduce the other two panelists who will each take five minutes and thereafter we go to the session of discussion. Uh, Mr. Pebelwood, please welcome for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and good day to everyone. And thank you also to the CTO and the Secretary General for the invitation to speak. Uh, what I think is a very relevant and very important conversation about the intersection between uh, HR and ICTs. Uh, the, 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 the keynote and the panel that just preceded, uh, I think I set an excellent stage and context for us. Uh, I want to look at the issue of rethinking capacity building in the 21st century. And I, I want to use the, my experience of the last uh, few years in particular, both in terms of the Caribbean and building out uh, learning and capacity building programs that cover everything from the technical community um, contribution toward building local infrastructure to working with governments and, um, and private sector organizations across the Commonwealth as they, they, they wrestle with the challenges of digital transformation. I want to bring those into, into this presentation and share with you some thoughts around uh, what, what I believe are some of the real priority areas for uh, capacity building inside of this new context that we find ourselves in. Uh, all too often, what's missing from the debate about capacity development is how we link um, the, the programs or, or make the case for linking, measuring, synchronizing, and securing the bridge between programs and the development goals. Uh, and, and, and to me, the, the connection between the, the reason we train, the reason we develop persons and our ultimate development ambitions or intentions is foundational to how we leverage and utilize uh, technology optimally. So we want to look at re-engineering capacity development in that context. And as several of the, the speakers have pointed out, it is, it is, very, it is almost impossible to consider uh, the way forward without considering our, our current context, which is the current COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and inside of this, uh, this pandemic, I think there's some important points that have come up that we can use, in, in, use as a lens to consider uh, where we are and where things are concerning um, capacity development. Because it has brought very squarely to the, the front um, the inadequacies at both the national and regional and global levels as it relates to preparing for the world that we're inside of. So in a sense, the, the crisis has, has shone a spotlight on long-standing issues concerning the, the use of technology. But more than that, it has shone the, 
the, the light on long-standing issues concerning inequitable access, concerning inadequate infrastructure, concerning uh, policies that support or impede national development goals. And so if we use that as our backdrop and we, we consider this simple statement, capacity development basically is supposed to create the capacity for development then we can look at, at the, the we can look at the issue of where should our hr development focus be and how would this intersection between human resource development and technology um, really operate if capacity development is intended to create the skills the knowledge the resources and i think very 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 critically the mentalities necessary for sustainable development then how do we um, how do we close these gaps that are being exposed now and how do we build the bridges that we need to go forward? So in that context, if, if we consider the, the fact that a lot of the technologies that have allowed us to navigate our way through the crisis, and we heard the Secretary General talk about the fact that the, the CTO, for example, has had to continue its meetings online and many of our organizations have had to find ways to conduct business and continue um, plans uh, in spite of the fact that we can't assemble in the way that we wanted it or we can't collaborate in the way that we wanted it. Then we know that what we're dealing with is more than just um, a challenge of technology or resources. What we're dealing with is a, the, the paradigm that says, if we have to proceed and if development is an imperative that must not ever be stopped, then how do we create amongst our people the understanding that they have the, the first responsibility to ensure the continuity of government systems, private sector organizations, or development programs. And, and that, that, that connects with something that the previous panel has, has um, touched on, which is the issue of the overlap between infrastructure, digital skill development, digital literacy, uh, appropriate tools, but also uh, relevant human resource development, and so I, I want us to um, to look at at the uh, look at the issue in the context of uh, the need for accelerating our approaches to digital transformation. Now, the words digital transformation uh, have long been used; uh, it has been part of the um, the lingo for some time now. It formed the CTO. It was behind all of the e-government programs of the, the, the 90s, it, 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 wove, it, it wove its way into um, the, the digitization projects of the early 2000s. It's not new, but what is new is the imperativeness of it. The, the, it is no longer optional. It is the only way that we can continue to, um, to, to, to progress. And so what, what it allows us to do in terms of looking at, at the technology human resource intersection, it allows us to consider uh, the issue of and focus on the priority for local capacity development. The, 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 the constraints that we now have in terms of the movement of peace, people, both within countries and, and across countries, um, the way in which meetings are conducted and training is facilitated, uh, has now put this, this very significant attention on local capacity to develop local solutions for local challenges. And to have those local solutions become the basis upon which we create our international or intra-regional opportunities. Uh, I, I put it this way, digital skill development must meet development needs. So capacity development investments must be aligned with identified development needs. And, and this is where the issue of the, the new partnership between HR and other players or other tiers of the institutional uh, hierarchy become important because the capacity development investments have to be linked to the, the importance of having the correct, the appropriate, the relevantly trained human resources within institutions and across institutions. And that means as, as the previous panel had indicated, sometimes justifying the, both the investment need, but also the investment return which means that HR practitioners have to, to develop new, new, new language skills in communicating with their counterparts across the boardrooms and across the decision-making tables. Um, and we can, we can also acknowledge that they, we increase the value of our, our organizational and national competitiveness 
when we increase the amount of local services that we make available to both internal and external stakeholders over local infrastructure. It is one thing in a former era, long ago and far away when we were able to all, uh, without restrictions, assemble in buildings and offices to allow our IT departments to determine the quality of infrastructure in the building for the office. As we've gone to, to the restrictions of um, the pandemic induced restrictions, the, the investment in infrastructure is now no longer uh, an office issue, it's a home issue. It's a wherever I might be working from issue. And that means new conversations between, um, between groups within organizations and across organizations about how this development gets facilitated. So what is required now is a combination of, of both the strategic and the practical mechanisms for integrating our, our communities. And communities here, both the, the institutional communities, but also in society, so that uh, where there are pockets of talent and pockets of skill, like our technical or ICT um, uh, workers or, or, or functionaries, then there has to be a new connection between the beneficiaries of that so that they can benefit. This means a radical shift, as has been said before, from consuming technology products and digital products and digital content to producing it. The assumptions we once made about how easy it was both to have access to, to, to content, whether it was for training or whether it was for, for work, or have access to resources, actual equipment and tools, uh, those assumptions have been upended by the current crisis. Importing goods, importing services, importing technology, importing support is now all more challenging than it ever was before. And that means a mapping of what, what it means now is that we have to differently map the required um, components for securing our technological advance. And we also have to map the required components for securing our institutional um, priorities and our institutional goals. Uh, put, put differently, companies, organizations, governments, private sector, countries, must now think very differently about what information security is and what technological security is, because they can't make the same assumptions about where they would get support from or how accessible that support will be when it is needed. That means a focus on new internal or indigenous capacity. So I wanted to close with, with these two points, the, the, the development of a sustainable value chain um, where and we can get into this in the discussion that follows where enabling infrastructure is a foundation upon which digital skills training is, is, is identified, targeted and executed upon which uh, local digital con local content development, which is not just web pages and videos and so on, but, but actual software and actual hardware and actual services that get built upon these things. And then on top of that, the protection of local intellectual property and access opportunities for new markets uh, become part of a chain that HR, HR um, practitioners understand that they're deliberately building and that they deliberately invest in securing within organizations. Only through these kinds of strategic approaches can we ensure that we have the domestic capacity that is needed now and into the future. So to summarize, uh, the enablers for accelerating this kind of capacity development, leadership, 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 the conversations that take place in what was previously referred in the previous panel referred to as the C-suite or the executive suite or the leadership level to a large extent determine how the mapping of needs to development goals um, becomes effected. Uh, secondly, the technical infrastructure and this applies whether we're dealing with an institution or we're dealing with a nation, uh, building out that infrastructure capacity by having the right conversations with the right technical inputs uh, is going to be foundational. The partnerships that allow us to leverage skills and capacity that might be that, that may not be inherent within our institutions um, or within our divisions. Uh, the issue of affordable and equitable access both to technology and technology skills community empowerment and digital literacy, I think round out the, the discussion around what might the key enablers be. The chart on the left will show you that inside of this are some of the issues raised already in the, in the previous sessions about mentors, support programs, uh, different kinds of, of content, and so on. 
So I want to leave this with you as the, the enablers for accelerating capacity development and the lens through which we look at uh, uh, an evolved approach to prioritizing capacity development initiatives. But at the end of the day, even though it's about a technology enabled capacity development future, the thing that never changes, that never ever, ever changes is not the technologies, but how people choose to use it. How people choose to use it is always a real catalyst to development. And to me, and the reason I want to leave this as our closing point is this makes it fundamentally a human resource development priority. This brings it back into our wheelhouse. And this allows us to develop not just persons with the requisite technical skills, but with the requisite mentalities needed to take our institutions and our countries forward. Now with that, I thank you and I'll close here. Hello, Jim. I don't know. Um, are you uh, over, over to you to introduce the panelists of your session? If uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I can, if I can encourage, um, if I can encourage uh, Mr. But sorry, Bevel to, um, to add, open his camera up again. Um, I, Irene, I, I, I would need the host to do that, Robert. Okay, I thank you, know. Irene. Could you please um, just assist us here? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. There was an interruption, technical interruption, and I'm here for that. Um, now we go to the panelists. We have uh, Lara Pesh. Lara is head of uh, capacity building at uh, Protection Group International, where she's been since uh, last year. Uh, she has also been working internationally in the ICT arena in the ICT arena and particularly in cyberspace. And uh, she has an, a lot of experience and knowledge of the Commonwealth and in particular the cyber capabilities of uh, each of the member states. Welcome very much, Lara. Uh, may I give you the first five minutes and then after that I will give to Anna. Welcome. Absolutely, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I would like to thank the CTO for inviting us. It's a very special and um, uh, privileged affair for me to be speaking with you today because um, I started my career serving the Commonwealth. Um, and now I'm sat at um, Protection Group International, which is a British, British digital risk um, company. And we're focused on um, cybersecurity um, and capability development. We've worked with more than 50 countries um, around the world, helping them build their cybersecurity capability and manage their digital risk. Um, we have a very strong focus on human aspects of digital risk and security, and we're a training provi provider with 30 plus specialist courses. Um, I spent some significant time thinking of how I can leave you with a message in five minutes that would inform your debate today and shape some of your thinking. And the first thing that I wanted to do is talk about national cybersecurity capacity. Um, it's important to talk about this because I think the term capacity building gets bounded around in all shapes and sizes. Um, very often. But for the content of today's discussion, we should think of capacity building as national investments in capability to address digital risk at all levels. And I was really happy to hear Bevo just now in his presentation talk exactly about that, about national investments in capacity development. So, of course, um, when we think about cybersecurity, there's capacity and capability that is required. 
um, that looks at national strategic vision, um, which should be informed by national level risks and current maturity, capability that looks at effectively investing in the criminal justice system to process electronic evidence, capability of the education sector to effectively deliver a sustainable stream of human resource to implement or maintain that strategic vision. There is also capability that looks at securing infrastructure, capable, capability that looks to create and enforce standards across industry for cybersecurity, capability that enables information sharing and effective incident response. And as you can imagine, the list will go on. So for the benefit of today's audience, um, I would like to focus on people. And perhaps here, yeah, um, um, uh, I should say that I'm not an HR um, professional, I'm a cybersecurity professional. Um, so I just want to make that, that, that qualifier there. So how does an organization, enterprise, or even a nation state grow, go from ground zero to building a skilled and sustainable workforce that enables an organization or an administration to address digital risk? And I thought about um, a couple of steps that I think would be practical and helpful for you today. So I think step one is really important to establish your priorities. And typically your priorities are informed by the kind of assets an entity or, an, or a jurisdiction in question has um, in its portfolio. So what level of risk are you willing to tolerate and which of these assets are absolutely uncompromisable to cyber attack? So now you understand the, 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 the critical points that you need to protect. Step two, understanding your risk. So constantly reviewing systematically um, um, and methodologically, understanding your landscape, understanding the level of risk and threat, coupled with the knowledge of your assets that you've already undertaken in step one, um, understanding the threats you care about, the ones that you don't think are so significant to your portfolio, um, and the level of risk assigned to each of these enables the entity in question to understand what an organization's workforce needs to look like. Step three, so understanding job roles. So there's a lot of confusion as to the demand of cybersecurity skills that are required. There are many different job roles, each with its specific set of requirements and sophistication of training. Sometimes this is overwhelming. The requirements to have a combination of these job roles is entirely driven by your risk register and the assets to hand, and they all have different associated costs and required in different volumes. So some of these job roles could be um, cybersecurity policy and audit specialists incident responders, SOC and threat intelligence analysts, digital forensics. Similarly, the list goes on. The good news is there are internationally recognized workforce frameworks, such as those provided by CSEC and NEST, which set out the roles and levels. You just need to work out which ones you need. Step four, this is the interesting bit. So you've mapped it, you've understood what it is that you're trying to do. You have an understanding of where do you want to go? How do you train them? So this question, unfortunately, is entirely driven by budgets, um, but also driven by staff enthusiasm to learn and perhaps an HR vision. Approaches can range from self-study or learning on the job to classroom-based training. There are, of course, incredibly su suitable international providers who can provide training for any task or role. These are typically high cost, but a cost that is justified on certain occasions just depends on, on the volume of um, uh, people you're trying to train. There is also a second option. Um, and I think I want, to, um, I want to go back to something that Secretary General said earlier today about creating local capital and something that also Bevel just, um, a point Bevel just made in his previous presentation about creating the local skill. Um, there is this option to own the training provision entirely. So you could create a trainer trainer program that enables an organization to continuously draw on this growing pool of qualified people to train future cohorts, advancing skills of an organization from rel relatively ground zero to senior members of staff. And this is the element of sustainability that I think is incredibly important. And um, 
we often um, don't focus on. I think I'm going to leave you with like two reflective points, and um, these refer to um, staff retention in cybersecurity roles. Often, cybersecurity um, training and qualifications um, suggest that um, uh, suggests a very expensive cost. Um, and organizations that invest in cybersecurity professionals from a public sector um, often see uh, migration into the private sector. So the first point is, um, I think it's important to really develop and draw career development parts in an organization so that as an individual, you can see and understand how your training applicable on the day job as much as possible because it becomes practical, enables him or her to climb to the next level of their career trajectory, thus enabling them to do more sophisticated jobs and remunerated accordingly for the more sophisticated job responsibilities. The workforce frameworks I mentioned earlier are very helpful here. And the second point is when highly trained individuals do move into the private sector after completing high level sophisticated training and garnering significant experience, this perhaps should not be looked at a loss of the entity. I would go as far to say that actually it is a win for the nation state, because so long as that individual form parts of the national ecosystem, that individual will undoubtedly contribute to manage, managing digital risk in their own capacity from within the private sector. And if you've got your talent pool correct, there are more talented individuals longing to be promoted into the role for which they can be prepared throughout their career, which the more senior people have just vacated. Um, I think uh, I can talk about sustainability of capacity building and I can talk about um, uh, digital skills for, for a significant amount of time, but I'm conscious that uh, um, I have been asked six to five minutes. So I look forward to the Q&A and I will hand over to yourself, Juma. Thank you so much for the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for that short presentation. I know you, we are pressed on time. I wish we had more time for it. Uh, may I now introduce uh, Hannah? Hannah is uh, the Director of Human Resources at uh, Fortafone, Ghana, where she joined the last year. She started her career as a marketing executive with the multimedia uh, broadcasting company in Ghana. She has also worked with Ernest and Young as a consultant with the HR advisory consultants, consultancy team. She has also worked before at uh, Medtronic, a world leader in medical device technologies, and as well as uh, Honeywell in the USA. Uh, Anna, you are most welcome. Uh, I give you the first five minutes, uh, make a short presentation. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juma. Uh, good morning, Madam Secretary General and other distinguished delegates. So for the next five minutes, I'm going to look at uh, traditional methods of training or learning um, versus e-learning. Um, more and more as technology impacts every inch of our lives, organizations have moved more to e-learning methods, some completely, uh, and some using a hybrid approach. Depending on the organization size, these learning methods can provide significant advantages um, or provide you know, uh, disadvantages or cons as well. Now, each method, like I mentioned, has its pros and cons. During this pandemic, the COVID pandemic, we have seen an even faster adoption of e-learning. And, um, for us at Vodafone, about 98% of our employees have been working remote since March last year. So this has required that we continue to deliver learning, albeit remotely. And I'm sure that is the case for your organizations as well. Now let's look at the traditional approach and permit me to use the CTO HR and ICT conference um, as an example. So a few years ago, we were all meeting face to face um, to get the learnings that we are getting today. It would take an inordinate amount of planning, production and fanfare to get speakers, attendees all to one location. 
where most people had to travel to. I believe the last one I attended was in uh, the Caribbean. People had to adjust their schedules, dedicate about five days, sometimes a week, taking into consideration travel time, et cetera, to get there. Now, due to costs involved as well, the number of people who could attend face-to-face -face were pretty limited. Now, on the plus side, though, there is something to be said for the face-to-face -face interaction, the ability to eyeball your listeners and sometimes adjust what you're saying, um, read body language, and then maybe afterwards huddle in small groups to have further discussions and network. I think we all miss that side as well. However, on the other hand, today's session is virtual and open to as many people as wanted to join which also means that we're imparting learning and knowledge to a bigger audience than would have been traditionally possible. I also see that the session is being recorded, which means that even more people can assess this way, uh, this, this session at way after it has ended and even play it at their own pace while relaxing at home uh, in the evening with a nice cup of tea or a glass of wine, whichever you please. I'm also positive there are significant cost savings as well from hosting this year's session virtually. On the other hand, virtual environments come with the usual distractions that the audience would have to deal with and that the facilitators or the trainers would have to take into consideration as well. Now, some may be multitasking um, or being distracted by their kids if you're working from home and have kids around or being pulled into other meetings if you're in the office, right? Because people know that Ashoka is here, my door can be opened and somebody can ask me a quick question. Uh, we also have to contend with technology failures that happen. And then depending on which side of the world you are, you can be faced with power issues or network challenges. The advantage is that infusing e-learning in our organizations cannot be overemphasized, especially in these times where we have remote workers and we need to reach them quickly and at minimal costs. Employees appreciate being able to learn at their own pace. And for us, creating bite-sized training videos on the go has been very, very impactful for many employees. With both forms of training delivery, uh, however, we have to look at an integrated approach if we are to maximize training. An integrated approach basically means that we're focusing on making the connections among the concepts that we're teaching and the experiences, um, bringing in different experiences so that participants and learners can quickly apply the knowledge that, they are, uh, that they're getting in the classroom or via online learning and apply it very quickly to novel and complex issues that are facing them in the workplace. There are different ways to ensure that we are having an integrated approach uh, to learning. Some of them include gamification. Um, gamification not only makes learning fun, it also allows us to bring real world context that makes it easier for learners to connect the dots between what we are learning and actual problems or issues that we need to solve. Another approach is to integrate role playing asking for real examples from learners that participants um, yes. who are trying to learn, try to solve as they learn makes a big impact as well. Sorry, is everything? Uh, please continue, Lara. Uh, please continue, Anna. Uh, sorry, Hannah, could you just unmute yourself, please? Yeah, thank I think I was, sorry, sorry about I that. was muted at the point. Okay. Um, let me see. All right, let me, let me just go back a few points. So I was talking about um, making sure that we adopt an integrated approach to, to learning um, and to training. And um, one thing that we can do is adopting gamification in our trainings. Um, this only not makes learning fun, but it also helps us to bring in real world context that makes it easier for the learners to connect the dots between what they're learning and then the actual problems or issues that they will be going back to solve. 
Another approach is to integrate role playing. So asking for examples of real solutions, sorry, real problems that participants are facing um, and then trying to integrate learning to be able to solve that particular problem also helps them um, retain the knowledge quicker. The other way as well too is moving from a more, moving to a more facilitator approach versus a lecturer approach, uh, which allows learning between participants. So everybody having gotten the context of what uh, uh, the objectives of the training program are, bringing in their own thoughts about um, different experiences and different contexts that they have been through before also really enhances um, how we pass learning to participants. And then more importantly, adopting a pool approach that we have found really is um, more helpful than pushing training out all the time to employees. So for us, um, I'll give you an example. So last year we identified 14 digital skills that we decided were core to our future as a tele telecommunications, um, sorry, a technology communications organization. Um, these included um, artificial intelligence, robotics, cybersecurity, social media marketing, fintech, etc. Now, with each of these 14 core areas, we then have courses that are available in our Vodafone uh, University our learning platform where employees can access modules at their own pace. And we have seen the adoption um, since we launched this, and we have seen that employees are actually going on there to equip themselves with the knowledge that they need. Technology has, um, I mean, basically to conclude, technology has really given us an edge and it's, it behooves us to keep up with the changing trends, the new trends, innovations that are coming up so that we can continually provide value to our organizations and ultimately improve the employee experience. Thank you very much. Um, I'll hand it back over to you, Juma. Thank you very much, Anna, for that presentation. Uh, we now go to the session of questions. I think I've, I've already seen on the Q&A, there are three questions. Uh, the first question, uh, uh, this particularly goes to, to Mr. Uti. And the question is, do you think that HR practice in the Caribbean is ready in attitude and competence? to lead the ICT integration into the organization. Uh, if you can address that, I would appreciate. Sure, I, I, I can, but I think the, the question goes beyond the Caribbean. It, it has to do with the, the, this dynamic or this relationship that now has to, uh, to be present between the IT function within organizations and the HR function. And, and, and to my mind, it's not a question of who leads, but it's more a question of how that collaboration or that, that new dialogue takes place. Uh, they, it, it, it is also, interesting or ironically, it was also a training issue. There's a new language to be learned by HR practitioners as it relates to interacting and engaging the IT division or the IT uh, component of an organization. Uh, th there, is a, there is a common ground that has to be found but it is possible to find it. And in finding it together, I think the, the dialogue, the mentalities and the attitude toward how uh, the two groups can work together uh, is indeed possible in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Thank you very much. I think the next question is to Lara. Uh, please, uh, what is the role of cybersecurity in enhancing effective HR? And how would uh, HR professionals utilize cybersecurity? Lara, please. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for that question. I think there's two parts to it. So first, there's the there's there's as an HR function in an organization, you obviously want to foster um, uh, digital skills to ensure that there is cyber resilience at the entity level. Um, so as an HR professional and an HR um, strategic decision-making, you want to ensure that there is investments in cyber skills. I mean, if you're starting right from the beginning <clears throat> and you're starting to introduce um, cybersecurity training in your organization. Um, there are a number of qualifications that you could look at. Um, 
you know, the CompTIA Networks Plus and the Security Plus certifications are really, really good because um, they're very broad and they're very good as um, uh, introductory qualifications for graduates and also in terms of reskilling your current IT staff. Um, that's a good way to go about it. In terms of using cybersecurity for HR, um, I think on that point, um, going back to um, the keynote speaker, one of the things that you need to consider as an HR department and an HR function is data, right? Um, uh, is ensuring that there are enough cybersecurity considerations in there to protect the data of your employees. And then I think actually, as I was speaking now, I think the third point for me, <clears throat> going back to the comments that I made earlier, as an HR function, you really should be um, using cybersecurity skills frameworks and being very transparent in the trajectory of um, uh, career paths for your staff. I think um, uh, in the first session, there was a lot of discussion about employee engagement and having skills frameworks that are very clear and transparent and every understand, everybody understands their path and their progress um, establishes a certain level of engagement across an organization. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Unless there's more. Thank you very much, Lara. I think there are two other questions. Uh, each of the pan, any of the panelists can pick it up. The first one is, or the first one is, in companies where HR is strategic versus administrative, the HR team plays a critical role in determining business results. A strategic HR team can lay can, can lay claim to increasing market share, growing the customer base, driving product innovation, increasing sales, and helping the company be more archived, among other accomplishments. My question then is, where the HR team, where the HR team is seeking more the interest of senior management, the board, rather than the employees below in the organogram, can this be achievable? I think any of the panelists can take up that. Let me also read out the second question so that any of you can take uh, any of the questions. Companies are eager to measure employees' data and gain visibility into where the business is headed. A, co a comprehensive set of HR metrics coupled with predictive capabilities can help you maximize your existing workforce and acquire fresh talent. How could this be realistic? I would like to invite any of the panelists to address those questions. All right, Juma, so I'll uh, try, um, sorry, to address yes, the first, back. yeah, to address yes. the first question. Um, so providing that, I'll first start off by saying that providing value to our organization and to employees does not have to be mutually uh, exclusive. And there's a saying here that we have um, a Vodafone that in God we trust or else bring data. So ensuring that you there's data, there's analytics behind whatever that you're presenting, it is core and it is absolutely important. So especially for us as an HR organization, um, a lot of the things that we want to push out, a lot of the things, innovations and programs that um, we want EXCO approval on, we need to ensure that we have um, analyzed what it is that we're doing. Does it have value to the organization in terms of either cost saving, in terms of either enhancing employee experience, um, impacting you know, the bottom line directly um, and all of that. So we have an HR analytics team that provides, you know, so, and I'll give you an example. So some of the metrics that we measure, uh, HR metrics is employment costs as a percentage of service revenue, um, we also measure, you know, spans and layers of control, how effective that is in the field setting, you know, the sales organizations versus, you know, being in um, the more corporate sessions, etc. So a lot of the things that we go, you know, asking for approval for to do has to be backed by actual, um, actual analytics and actual data. Thank you very much, Anna. Mr. Hooding, would you want to attempt the 
other question? I think Lara wanted to ask a question. Yeah, thanks, Bevo. Um, uh, um, uh, Hannah, I absolutely loved the um, In God We Trust or Earth Green Data. I'm going to be sharing that across the company because I think it's brilliant. Um, and obviously, I'm not an HR prof professional, but I've been doing capacity building for um, a decade and a bit. And I'm going to approach that question from that perspective. Um, and I think in terms of engagement of... Um, you know, different people sat in the organization, but also at the board level, you really need to measure the impact of capacity building interventions. And I think that is really what the key is. So when we talk about capacity building, um, preparing for digital skills, etc., cetera, um, what we really need to understand is whether as an HR department you are investing, there's an echo, is this me? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. I, can, I can hear that too, but it's, yeah, continue. I think that there's, I'm not sure what that interference is. Thank you. Okay. So whether you're investing 10 pounds or whether you're investing a hundred or a million, what's really important is to understand that concept of your return on investment. And once you have that data, and once you understand how you're going to measure that, um, then it's very, very easy to make the case to the board to reallocate funds for additional capacity building. The question is, at least for a cybersecurity point, what sort of data do you need to be collecting in order to evidence impact? Because cybersecurity is so incredibly intangible. And if we look at national cybersecurity capacity, the kind of data um, that we need to evidence impact is not actually being collected. So how do we make the case for the right data to be collected and not have an avalanche of data just for the sake of collecting data to try and prove um, uh, uh, impact. We need to be efficient with the data we collect. Thank you very much, Lara. Uh, since we are coming to an end of our session, I would like to give each person just uh, to make one statement concluding your presentation. I would like to give uh, Bevil to make one statement, and then after that, uh, Sarah, Anna, and uh, Lara. So, Bevin, please. Thank you. Uh, my, my statement would be, would be very simple. The, the dynamics of the, the current context that we find ourselves in requires a new dialogue between the human resource component or stream and the other areas of the organization. So that capacity development can be linked, aligned, synchronized, harmonized, whichever word you want to choose, with the institutional goals. Um, and that, that requires uh, a very deliberate approach to, um, to the, the conversation dynamics and to measuring the impact of any capacity development initiative that is undertaken. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Bevel. Uh, Hannah, please. Thank you very much, Juma. Um, so, as we look at the various technologies that are available now to us and innovation that we have to incorporate, you know, training and online training and also various aspects of including these various trainings, uh, sorry, these various technologies in our delivery, we have to be very mindful as well not to lose sight of completely shutting out the traditional ways um, of training, of imparting knowledge. It is still very important and it still has a place, especially when it's a small group of people, a small size of people having that face-to-face -face interaction and feeding off the um, feeding of the, 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 the engagement uh, from at other participants cannot be overemphasized. So it still does have its part. Um, e-learning, especially if you're going to create an e-learning platform can be extremely costly. And so looking more at um, how your organization is sized, the, how much you can actually put into this, all has to be considerations um, in moving completely to an e-learning platform. Thank you very, very much, uh, Anna, for that concluding remark. Um, Lara, please. Uh, Juma, thank you. Um, 
I think when we're thinking about capacity building, we're thinking about training. I mean, if we think about cybersecurity, um, the past 15 years, we have to celebrate the incredible progress that we have made in terms of national strategy and policy relating to cybersecurity. I think there has been a little bit of a disconnect with um, building the human capital to sustain that strategic vision. And I don't think it is relevant to a particular region. I think this is apparent all over the world. Um, so I really think the next decade is going to be a focus on, on human capital and really equipping them. Um, my second point is there are loads of open standards available, um, but open standards typically are designed for the entire world and they need adaptation for your um, local context, which is very important to bear in mind. And then thirdly, um, your budget is very important. Um, irrelevant of how big or how small your budget is, what is really important is to be incredibly efficient and effective with it. And if you have IT staff, the best thing you can do with the little res financial resource you've got available is to start um, uh, converting your IT staff to be cyber first aiders, um, because there is definitely a huge lack of incident response. Uh, responders across the world. So if you can start with that, um, that, that, that is incredibly valuable. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Lara, for that summary. I want to thank uh, the three presenters, Pevil, uh, Lara, and Hannah, for sharing your experiences and expertise. I am sure these skills will be useful to all the delegates. I also want to thank all the delegates for listening for this presentation. Thank you very much, we appreciate you. May I hand over now to Robert for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juma. Thank you very much to Laura, Hannah and Bevel as well. So, so that was a very interesting session. Now, we um, have a 15 minute comfort break now, but um, before we um, move away from our computers to I don't know, use the bathroom or make ourselves a cup of tea or coffee, um, can I encourage you to fill in the poll, which is going to be uh, displayed on your screen? Um, Irene, if you could just publish that now. Um, and yeah, that's fantastic. So um, it's, a, it's a very short poll, but um, the results of that will be played at the uh, when we when we come back. So um, if I can encourage the speakers to be back in sort of 10 minutes, um, but we've, we've got a, a full 14 minutes now. It's, it's one minute past 11. All right. 11, sorry, 11.30, 11 11.31. So 11.45, the next session starts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Jim.
Hello, but hi, hello, Zach Kelly. Sorry, I should. Hey, hey Robert. Good, good to hello. see you both. And Janet's joined us as well, so uh, uh, it might be a good idea. Just uh, Janet, are you there? Ah, fantastic. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Good to see hi, you. Hi, everyone. So we're making good. We're keeping on track of time, which is fantastic. So you've got full full length of time. We're going to be starting in four minutes time. <laughs> what so is the of time? Yeah, we have. We done well. <laughs> Jim is a good timekeeper, so uh, he always uh, uh, put him in his chair and he always makes sure he finishes on time. <laughs> cool. So um, before we start the next session, you can see hopefully the, the poll results on your screen. Well, they've just, they've just dropped off mine now, but uh, thank you for, to, to those that uh, took the time to complete that, that, that short poll. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I think that that's probably the 15 minutes over now. I can see that it's it's very close to quarter to, to 12 at um, UK time. So I'm going to start the next session. I can see that the speakers are all here, so we might as well. It's uh, session three, and it's Creative HR, uh, Innovative ICT Platforms and Technologies. We have Mr. Zakeli Kharanga. Uh, Mr. Z Mr. Zakeli Kharanga is the Human Resources Executive at the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. Um, Ikasa, a role he has held since 2017. He provides strategic direction ensuring the authority's business strategy aligns with the people's strategy. And he is an experienced human resources executive with a strong blend of strategic, tactical, and operational experience across the public and private sector. If I could in, uh, invite uh, Zakeli to uh, introduce uh, the session and then hand over to the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, let me greet everybody in all their time zones. Good morning, good evening. Um, without wasting time, my name is Zakele Khanaha uh, Robert. 
Um, I'm going to introduce my first speaker, um, Bud Willemsen. I'm calling it uh, like an Anglo-Saxon South African. Uh, Mr. Willemsen joined the, UN, the UNICEF's HR management team in New York, responsible for HR uh, policy, administrative law, and uh, social benefits. In, in 2020, he transferred to Bonn. Uh, to start his current role as the Chief Compensation and Classification in the UN Secretariat. Uh, in this role, he's responsible for one HR center and the UN's local salary survey process in almost 107 countries. Um, his presentation is a case study that's going to be based on the one HR that he's responsible for at the UN. Uh, but I'm not going to waste a lot of time. Over to you. Thank you, Zakele, for the, uh, the introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to, um, to speak to, um, to all of you today. Um, I would like to, um, to first thank the, uh, the Secretary General, of course, for, uh, for inviting us to, um, to speak um, about the 1HR Center. Um, and uh, it was hoped that our Assistant Secretary General for Human Resources, Ms. Martha Elena Lopez, could um, could attend this session and, and speak to you today, but she sends her regrets. Um, so I will speak to you today in, in her stead. Um, and as uh, Zakele mentioned, I, I transferred to, uh, to Bonn um, in, uh, in March 2020. Um, and I, I don't think I need to do more marketing um, for Bonn as a, as, a, as, a, as a city to live in um, with, with, with what I have behind me. This is an evening shot of the, um, the UN premises. Um, now, let me uh, dive, dive quickly into the, uh, the presentation, uh, a case study about, about 1HR. Um, and uh, I, I wish, uh, because that would be really quite the introduction, that I could tell you that the idea for the UN 1HR Center um, was developed um, either in a laboratory or at the International Space Station. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I, I cannot. Um, the, the idea for the, the UN One HR Center was, was really quite a simple one, um, although as it always turns out to be uh, much more difficult to implement. Um, and this was really in, uh, in, in 2015, 16, um, when uh, the UN started to seriously think about reforms where um, the organizations um, of the UN system, and we have more than more than 30 organizations, and, and they come together um, numerous times a year in, in, in multiple fora, um, started to think um, about reform in the human resources area, um, and essentially thought if, if we have all these human resources activities um, that we all have to undertake, and we all use the same standards for these activities, um, doesn't it make sense to actually um, look at a global HR center that can offer these services to all of us as opposed to um, all of us doing this ourselves? Um, so it's really an, an, an economy of, of, of scale, um, thought, um, thinking about working better together, working more efficiently together. And this has really become one of the, one of the core pillars of the um, the UN Secretary General's management reform. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, why I'm glad that I can speak to you today about, about the 1HR Center. And I'm going to now try to pull up the um, presentation. So I have a little PowerPoint presentation. And Zarkele, if you could tell me, give me a thumbs up when we are, uh, when we are live with the presentation. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so um, it, just taking you back a couple of years, as I said earlier, um, the, uh, the, the first discussions about such a 1HR center um, started around 15 and 16, 2015, 2016, and in 2017, um, the HLCM uh, on behalf of the, um, uh, the chief executives of, of all the UN system organizations decided to establish this 1HR center. Um, and it was at that time agreed that the center would offer um, non-prescriptive, so it wasn't mandated for the organizations to use the center, 
um, job classification services and, and background verification services. Um, although it was noted at that time that um, other services, other HR related services could be, um, could be added in the future. Um, now, the value proposition of the One HR Center, and this is why I, I mentioned earlier that the idea itself is, is not terribly exotic, um, is that when you all undertake the same services, um, it makes sense to do that together, to, to integrate these services in one location um, uh, with the idea that you'd be able to do it faster than when you would be able to do it yourself or then have when, when you would do it yourself in-house, um, that it would cost less, be cheaper. Um, and for the UN system, it's, it's obviously very important that we harmonize um, it, it may sometimes seem from the outside that um, all the UN system organizations are, are fully harmonized on, on every level, um, but I, I, I have to admit that that's uh, definitely not always the case. And, and even when it comes to human resources, um, although most of our uh, member states are member states for all the different organizations, um, there, there are quite a number of, of differences. So harmonization is really an important, um, important element in, in the thinking about 1HR. Sorry to um, interrupt you, but can I just ask you just for one, just for um, the speaker view, just to put your slideshow in slide slide shared modes mode, so we don't see the, the other slides on screen at the same time. I do apologise for interrupting. Then it, it's just at the top of the top of the screen. You see slideshow and it you press from current slide. So keep going up to the uh, middle uh, of the screen. Slideshow is an extra animation, so it's um, keep going up. Your, your cursor is really almost there. You see, um, maybe no, I'll do it here. Uh, Slideshow. Slideshow is that's it, and then from from current slide, that's it. That's like the second one along. That's it. Perfect. Okay, and then it's just a case of clicking through. Thank you. Sorry for that. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Robert. Um, so um, here we are in um, in in 2021 now. So four years into um, into the One HR Center. Um, as I said, um, the focus is on job classification and and background verification. Um, at the moment, um, we have 11 UN system organizations that use the One HR Center for job classification. Um, we have 10 organizations that use the um, uh, One HR Center for background verification. Uh, I, I put in parentheses and counting because the number of organizations is growing. Um, although, and I'll come to that in a moment, it, it, it's not growing fast enough, we feel. Um, and, and that's why we're currently working on, on some quite fundamental improvements to, um, to the business model um, and to the service model. Uh, and I think after four years um, in, into its existence, that's, that's um, an opportune moment to actually do that based on the experience that we've, we've obtained. And, and maybe I should add, because this is interesting, of course, for, um, for the forum, um, the, um, uh, the United Nations or the, or the International um, Quickly check so that I'm not making a mistake in the abbreviation. Um, the International Telecommunications Union, my apologies, is one of the UN system organizations, um, which is at the moment not yet a client of the One HR Center, but hopefully that will that will happen in the, in the fairly near future. Um, let's go to the next slide. So just a, a closer look at, at the value proposition, because I think this is really the um, uh, the core strength of, of the One HR Center. Um, looking at it through the lens of, of job classification, um, almost every UN system entity um, engages in job classification. Um, it's essentially associating um, a set of duties and responsibilities to a particular grade so that we are sure that within the system that um, all staff members who undertake the same complexity of assignments are, 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 are paid the same. Um, so it's, hey, it's, it's an element of, of, of equality there. Um, so we all use the same standards. Um, now, if that's, if that's the case, then it, it does make a lot of sense to actually have, have this, this process, this self-classification process conducted in one location, which is what we do through the One HR Center. But there's, uh, there, there's another element that, uh, that, that, that helps the value proposition of the One HR Center, which is that organizations can now start through our database, um, use jobs that have been classified in one organization by the One HR Center um, directly without requiring um, a new classification exercise. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's all a little bit 
predicated on the idea of, of mutual recognition, which is a term that, that comes up quite a lot, I'm, I'm sure also in, 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 in your sphere of work, um, where you will work. And, and that's, as I said, that's, that's, that's the, um, the underlying um, assumption here. If, if the one HR center, because we all use the same standards, classifies a job for one organization, we can use that for the other organization. And, and then there's a third element is um, that we are currently um, diving much deeper into the, the possibility of using generic job descriptions. Um, again, the idea is not that dissimilar from, from uh, using a classified job for in one organization or from the other organization to actually use generic job descriptions that only need to be classified once and that all organizations can then use for a quite, quite wide range of jobs. Um, just to give an example, um, in, in, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, so that's why this is uh, for me an easy example. You can, I mean, every organization needs lawyers um, and, and, and these lawyers do different uh, or un undertake different tasks in the organization. When you look at the complexity, you might well be able to, to put them all at, at and depending on, on where they are in the hierarchy at the same level. Um, so you would need a really, you can use a really narrow skeletal job description um, for a legal officer, essentially, um, that organizations can then use. And of course, they can fill out the details of what that incumbent in the job would have to do based on, on, on exactly what that organization's mandate is. Um, and um, as I said, we, we, we allow now the organizations to use 1HR to, uh, had to, to look at information that is already, or jobs that have already been classified. Um, we have we've developed online online tools for that, um, and, and which is um, a very easy um, way for organizations um, and, and, and a digital way, an online way to use the uh, use the information from one HR. Um, in a way, that's the same for for background verification. Um, background verification is uh, in, in in the UN context, making sure that that applicants who are recruited have been truthful in their application documentation, essentially um, looking at um, academic credentials and professional experience. Um, and then there's a third branch of, of the, the background verification. I'm sure that will sound very familiar is that we look at, at prior conduct um, that could both be criminal conduct, um, but also professional misconduct, which is obviously something that, that happens much more often. Um, so the organizations that participate in the 1HR Center, we've, we've built interfaces um, with their IT systems. Um, if they have an applicant for a job and they need a background verification, the, um, the information is through the interface brought to the 1HR Center, um, all the application information, and then our, our team reaches out to prior employers, um, to um, academic institutions, um, and, and we run checks of a, a number of different misconduct or, or conduct related databases. And uh, here again, this is where the advantage of 1HR comes in. Um, once we've already checked a candidate for one organization, if another organization that uses 1HR is then recruiting the same individual because he or she is moving from one organization to the other, we obviously don't have to duplicate the work anymore. We can actually use the work that's already been performed by, by 1HR. We may need to do a supplemental check, but that's a very quick check because I mean things may have happened since since the last check. Um, so that's really where where the value added comes in from one HR. Um, now uh, I, I said earlier that uh, one HR is supposed to do the work faster and cheaper than um, when organizations would do it themselves in house. Um, faster is 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 easier to demonstrate. Um, it's cheaper, a little bit more difficult um, because it depends uh, to a large extent on the volume of work that the 1HR center processes and, and how quickly its database grows. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of my time on, on managing the 1HR center, um, but that means part of my salary um, needs to be paid by the organizations that participate in the 1HR center. Um, and of course, if, if it's only one organization, that, that can become quite costly. But if, if there are 10 or 15 organizations, um, then that part of my salary can be spread out over, over many organizations. So it's, I mean, that's again, um, an economies of scale argument and, and, an, and an efficiency argument. So that's why I said earlier, we have now quite a number of UN organizations that have joined over the years, but we need more organizations to join because um, that will actually then make the, 
the price of the services that we offer cheaper for everyone. Um, so there's there's an there's a there's an incentive for each organization, but also an incentive for all the organizations together. Um, I also said a little earlier that we're talking about updating our our, our business model, our service model. We we've we, we've called this one HR 2.0. Um, still under development, but um, I've just listed here a couple of the challenges and, and opportunities that we see. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the possibility to increase the number of services, add some services. Of course, ICT solutions. We have um, an ICT team within the UN that that helps us, and uh, have we, we're, we're constantly thinking about um, solutions and, and and innovations that make it even more attractive for organizations to use us. Um, we, I talked about the database. Um, of course, databases um, with personal information and, and and data protection. They all are often um, used together in one sentence. So that's something that we, we obviously very cognizant of and, and, and try to navigate um, our, ourselves in that, that minefield of, of legal issues on, on data protection. Uh, and as I said, we need to increase the number of, of client organizations. And we've, we've certainly been, been thinking and, and thinking about and discussing actually offering our services to, to non-UN system organizations. Um, now for job classification, that may not be that relevant because we obviously use our own standards, but for background verification, that might actually be uh, uh, interesting for organizations um, that, that are outside the common system. Um, so yeah, this brings me to uh, to the end. I, I hope, Robert, I haven't been looking at the time. My apologies, and, and Zarkele, I, I hope I kept it within 15 minutes. Um, so this is the uh, the final slide of the presentation. It's the little quote from the Secretary General. As I said, this one HR is one of the uh, the core pillars of his his management reform, um, and there's a lot of focus on on the one HR center. And um, I, I I wish I could take credit for it. Um, um, it's it's establishment, but I, obviously I cannot. I only joined about a year ago, so I, I inherited quite a bit of it. But it's a very interesting project um, with a lot of potential, which is why we are, are working on on now using the experience gained um, and 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 updating the model to make it more interesting for organizations, to make it more financially interesting to um, to join us. Um, thank you, and um, I, I know there will be a little bit of time for questions and answers um, later, but I've also indicated already and, and will share that with you. If you have questions uh, that you cannot answer in the Q&A, um, please um, ask Robert for my, my email um, contact and I'd be happy to, um, to correspond um, uh, over, over email and answer any additional questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, I think you did very well, considering the time constraints that we have going yeah. ahead. Um, let me repeat this, colleagues. Uh, so, Bud has committed to respond to questions offline. However, if you have questions, please use the, the button on the Q&A, and I think we'll address them later. Without much ado, let's uh, jump on to the next presentation. Thank you, Bud. Um, I'm going to introduce my second speaker, uh, Janet Stewart. Ms. Janet Stewart and her We Love Learning team are recognized among Canada's leading experts in designing and developing and building online learning solutions to meet training and education needs of organization. Janet is routinely invited to meet senior teams to discuss the future of learning. Uh, and how to make their training programs more accessible to their employees and customers through digital uh, learning solutions. Uh, let me allow Janet to take us through her presentation. And I think after then we'll take questions. Thank you. Janet Stewart is one of Canada's most respected learning design professionals. She got into e-learning about 10 years ago before it was mainstream because of her vision of the future of learning. With more than 30 years of experience in the training industry, she and her We Love Learning team offer high standards of training innovation and interactivity. They work with clients who want to take their internal education programs and move them into the future. Please welcome Janet Stewart. Greetings to all event attendees. While I wish I was with you in person, joining you virtually from my offices in Ottawa, Canada is the next best thing. Let's talk about the future of learning. I'm a learning experience designer. 
That means that I typically work with companies who need to create training for their employees or their customers. Training that they just can't go out and buy easily in the marketplace because the training deals with very specific information about their in-house policies, their practices, their procedures, or even their products. And so they need to work with someone like me to design, build, and deploy that training. Now, I spent more than two decades designing training for the in-person classroom, but over the last decade, my team and I have become specialists in designing learning solutions for the online classroom. The learning landscape has shifted, and as countries make the transition to the digital economy, so must the learning landscapes of these nations. In fact, the 2020 pandemic has accelerated the transition to the digital learning landscape. In previous decades, when an organization needed to train its employees or customers, it meant booking a conference room and coordinating travel, accommodation, and meals for many persons. Scheduling could be a difficult and time-consuming task. And invariably, some persons were not able to attend, leaving them with an important knowledge gap and no really good way to close it. Fast forward to the 21st century. Learning has never been more accessible to more persons than it is now. The reach of e-learning today is greater than ever, with the most rapid growth happening in emerging economies, working to close the education gap. The combination of low ongoing costs, high convenience, and easy accessibility are transforming e-learning into the predominant global educating force of the 21st century. Digital learning enables us to move past the have and have not societies that are created for those who have or do not have easy access to education and information because of their economic status or their geography. E-learning is an effective approach for the deployment of prerequisite training activities, education for the masses, and post-training performance support for those in the workplace, as well as for product and service support for customers. You may already be familiar with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You can find out more about them on the UN website. They have this really neat interactive tool that tells you about each of them. I've made a personal commitment to four of the goals and outlined those in an article on my own website. Let's take a closer look at how e-learning supports the four Sustainable Development Goals that really speak to me. Sustainable Development Goal number four is quality education. In-person training requires a specific time, date, and place, which means that some persons just cannot access it. Moving to online learning solutions means that anyone with a device, even a smartphone, and access to the internet can participate in the knowledge economy. And we know that access to education paves the way to economic growth for individuals, families, communities, and even nations. Access to online education means that anyone can learn the knowledge and skills needed to participate in the digital economy. In my own case, the kind of work that I do, consulting with clients about their training needs and then building a digital solution, can be done from anywhere in the world. My work is not limited by my location. And in this way, access to online learning solutions serves to reduce inequalities in our world. Someone living in a remote community, as long as they have a device and access to the internet, can seek the knowledge and develop the skills that they need to fully participate in the global economy. They are no longer bound by their location or the need for deep pockets to be able to travel to seek education. And finally, e-learning is good for the environment. When people no longer have to travel to seek education and knowledge, that cuts our CO2 emissions. As much as I might have liked to travel to the conference to be with you today, by speaking to you virtually, I've saved a plane trip, and that's good for the environment. E-learning is a spectrum of digital choices, and there's no one size fits all. As we go through this presentation, I invite you to type any questions that you have into the chat window, and we'll be sure to get to them at the end. Your definition of e-learning comes from your experience with it. By now, you've probably experienced a lot of VILT, virtual instructor-led training sessions. And you may have also done some self-directed online training. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read or consume this very busy graphic, but what I want you to take away is that there really are a lot of choices when it comes to e-learning. The virtual instructor-led training is at the bottom of this hierarchy. And as you go up the left side, you'll see that there are three additional levels. And as you go across, you'll notice that we move from simple to typical to complex approaches. The important thing for you to know is that as you go up the chart, the learner retention rates increase, as does the complexity and the time and cost to produce. The same is true as you go across the chart. 
Learner retention rates increase, as does complexity and time and cost to produce. So we know that the word e-learning means lots of different things to different people, and it's time to have some fun. We're going to explore the spectrum of vocabulary that comes to mind by working together to build a word cloud. So I want you to grab your smartphone and open up the camera so that you can play along. I also want you to make sure that you can see the conference chat window because there's going to be some important information posted there in a moment. Now before I show you how to play along, I want you to take a moment to reflect. Reflect on the words that come to your mind when you think of e-learning. We've already agreed that there are so many facets of e-learning, so get a few words ready in your mind. There's no limits to how many or how few you can contribute to this word cloud. Here we go. Open up the camera on your smartphone. An older phone might require a QR reader app to do this, so if it doesn't work for you, just open your browser instead and go to menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. Point your camera to the code on the screen. A little box will appear asking if you want to go to Menti. Just tap on that little box. So first step, open up your camera, hold it up to the QR code on the screen. If that doesn't work for you, then you can still play along by opening up your browser and navigating to menti.com. The second step is look in the chat for the numeric code that you need to enter and then enter that on your phone. The view on your phone should look something like the sample that's on the screen right now. The last step is to start entering all the words that come to your mind when you think about e-learning. Online learning, virtual learning, whatever you happen to call it. You can enter as many words as you like and then hit submit at the bottom. And you can enter more again after that if you like to. I'll give you a moment before I show you the word cloud that's forming. Okay, let's see what kinds of words are making their way to the word cloud. The future of learning microphone, camera, convenient, fun, revolutionary, modern. This is a word cloud that we're creating using a free tool called Mentimeter. I set up a word cloud in advance and then as people enter their words it builds the cloud for us. And that's how you create a word cloud. And it's one of the techniques that you can use to make virtual instructor-led training more interactive and engaging. Some of the words that you came up with were specific to that live online kind of training and other words spoke more to the self-directed training. Let's talk about my true passion, self-directed training. Self-directed online learning can be completed anytime from anywhere as long as the person has access to a device and, in most cases, to the internet, though that's not always necessary. The instructor and the learner are not there at the same time. We call this the asynchronous environment. You might have heard that term used before. And self-directed training can be completed on a desktop, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. It's a great approach for training as well as for workplace performance support. Not surprisingly, a survey of 800 corporations revealed that 86% of them have shifted some, most, or all of their in-person training to virtual over the past few months. That's a huge number. Now my personal observation is that many organizations scrambled to take in-person training that had already been scheduled and move it to live online. Some restructured the training and did it well, while others just took the death by PowerPoint approach. But that's a lesson for another day. The real opportunity in moving to digital training solutions is in the self-directed space. Many employees are only allotted somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes a week to do professional development. So if you attend even one live online class that's one hour in length, you've blown your budget for the entire week. But imagine self-directed training that can be completed in bite-sized pieces. A 15-minute course that's laser-focused on one topic or a 5-minute refresher on a process that's unfamiliar to you. This is the real power of self-directed training. The transition to the digital learning landscape was already well underway and had been for years, but the pandemic accelerated that transition. In the same survey results that were shared by the Learning Guild, 91% reported that their organization's future learning strategy will be permanently changed because of the crisis. 
and 71% reported an increase in the use of learning platforms. Platforms come in many shapes and sizes, but let me show you one example. You may have heard of the term LMS. It stands for Learning Management System. Your organization may even have one. An LMS is a digital space where you can organize your digital learning assets. These can be a combination of self-directed courses, live and recorded sessions, forums and discussion groups, and even micro videos. An LMS allows you to organize all of these assets in a way that makes it easy for your learners to find them. This is an example of what an LMS can look like. This is an LMS that we built for one of our clients. We've been creating self-directed courses and certificate programs for them for more than a decade. So you'll see that they have many areas of study and then many courses within each area of study. An LMS allows you to group things together to form certificate programs. For example, you could specify that the learner must complete a set of requirements in order to be awarded a certificate in a particular area of study. An LMS also gives you the power to set prerequisites, meaning that the learner must complete course A before they can complete course B, for example. And some learning management systems now have artificial intelligence built into them so that they can start serving up a personalized learning plan to each user based on their interests and previous completions. You need a learning management system if you want to be able to track course completions. In other words, if you want to know that someone has completed a particular requirement and when, and maybe even what score they achieved on their quiz, then you need an LMS. Not everyone needs a learning management system. However, they do have two benefits that make them worth considering. The ease with which they organize your content, be it courses, videos, or other digital assets. They can become the go-to place for information within your organization, and their ability to keep training records on your learners for you. But not everything needs to be organized into an LMS. Sometimes you might not be as concerned about record keeping. Perhaps you're a government department that wants to make information engaging and easily accessible to citizens. Or maybe you want to create some micro-training assets for your customers to access. This might help to reduce calls to your customer service department by making information about how to use your products and services readily available on your website. So let me show you what that might look like. First, let me tell you a little bit of background. This client's target audience is entrepreneurs who are creating businesses in the green energy sector. And on their website, they had a resource area where you could find a long list of tip sheets that were built in Word and saved as PDFs. You can see that the information was pretty plain. It was good information, valuable information, but it was really hard to consume because it was just black and white text. So the resource area on their website was not very helpful. So we took those 24 Word documents and we brought each one of them to life as a short course, each a 10 to 15 minute commitment, focusing on one learning objective. Then we loaded them onto their website to make them easy to find, right under their old resources tab. And we also used tagging to make it easy for someone to refine their search. So for example, if I want to learn something about branding, I can click on that tag and just those courses that have something to do with branding will come to the top. If you want to follow along and take a closer look at these self-directed courses, you can get to them by using this QR code. Just open up the camera on your smartphone Hold it up to the QR code on the screen right now, then tap the little box that appears, and you'll be taken directly to the resource area on the SNA website. And of course, if you're an entrepreneur, at least some of these courses may be of interest and value to you. Let's take a look at one of these courses together so that you can see the transformation from words on a page. When you open up the course, there is a bit of an introduction and a course outline. Then, when you start the course, it opens up and introduces you to the character in this course whose entrepreneurial journey we're going to follow. You can see that there are a number of simple techniques that we use to bring the content to life and create the opportunity for the learner to interact with the course by having to click on various things. We even used a photo with hotspots. And because this course is built in a product called Rise, it fits nicely into their website in terms of its look and feel. That's just one very simple example of how you can bring content to life in an online world, but it does take skill and ingenuity to do so. Go back a decade or more. When I was designing only for the in-person corporate classroom, it was enough to be an instructional designer. 
But now, to be successful in designing online training solutions, I've also had to develop the creativity of a graphic artist and the digital literacy skills of an IT professional. Let me show you another example of a self-directed course that demonstrates that point. In this case, we wanted to create an interesting way to move learners through a series of short videos on different but related topics. So we created an image with five doors and an intriguing image hidden behind each. In this way, we were able to allow learners to choose their own adventure. In other words, pick which door to explore first, and even created a bit of mystery by using images like a gorilla, which if you watch the video hidden behind that door, you would realize was totally relevant. Some persons ask me, is it really possible to teach people in an online environment? Isn't it all about the instructor? I agree that a great instructor makes for a great course. And so I would also say that great instructional design makes for a great course. Let me show you another example. We were asked to create a course for workplace health and safety representatives. And one of the topics that we needed to cover was doing an inspection in a workplace. So my colleague Carrie and I put our heads together to think about how could we recreate a workplace inspection in an online environment when the instructor and the learner would not be there at the same time. We decided to work with a client and one of their frontline workers. We even borrowed a workplace for a day and staged a series of photos that have hazards in them. When the learner arrives at this point in the course, they are invited to see if they can find all of the hazards in each of the photos. And once they make their selection, then we use shadow boxes to top up and clarify. This way we know that all of the hazards have been pointed out before the learner can move on to the next screen. But again, what about real people? Isn't it better to have the subject matter experts in the room with the learners teaching them in their own words? I'm glad you asked. We were asked to work with the members of a union to put together a series of courses that would form a certificate program. In this case, the subject matter experts were a group of very experienced workplace stewards. And as we went through the process of developing the content with them and then imagining how we would bring it to life, we decided that we wanted to bring them into the course to share some of the content in their own words. So we identified the content that really suited that approach. And of course, we wanted to have a balance and some variety throughout the design plan. Once we settled on the content to be covered by the stewards in their own words, my colleague Carrie scheduled a Zoom meeting with them, which we recorded. And that gave Carrie the raw footage that she needed so that we could integrate clips of them into the course design. And in this way, we were able to bring the subject matter experts right into the course, bringing the content to life in their own words. In fact, in this particular case, it could be argued that it was even better than an in-person experience because you would have only had the input from one steward in that case. But this way, the learner benefits from the views of four stewards instead. Let's recap. So far, we've covered two types of online training. VILT, which is virtual instructor-led training, and self-directed training, which often takes the form of courses that can be grouped together into certificate programs. But online learning provides for a plethora of choices, so let's take a look at some that could be used in the context of performance support in the workplace. I'm going to show you a micro video. Micro simply means short. A micro video on the topic of augmented reality. Augmented reality is proving to be a very useful tool for providing employees with just-in-time training in the workplace. AR brings some elements of the virtual world into our real world, and in doing so, enhances the things we see, hear, and feel. Imagine working in a warehouse where you need to operate large pieces of equipment. The operator arrives at a forklift that she's never used before, but is able to scan a sticker on the machine with a smartphone. The result? A one-minute video appears to review the most important safety features of the machine. How's that for efficient just-in-time training? Well, that's interesting, right? Imagine all of the things in a workplace that you could put a sticker on and then embed the training right onto that sticker. At the very least, you could put a sticker on the photocopier machine and embed micro-videos about the most complex functions. 
how about embedding micro training onto the products that your company uses or sells? Instead of having to create customer training programs, you could identify the need to know information and include it in the packaging or put it right onto the product face itself. Some of you may know Valerie Grant. She's a well-known entrepreneur in the Caribbean. And her company, Geotech Vision, sells drones as one of their lines of business. We did a pilot project with Valerie's team last year. They wanted to create a micro training to embed on a drone. The goal was to be able to show the user how to set up and calibrate the drone right in a field, literally. I don't have the sound turned on right now, but we took a series of photos that they sent to us, then added a script which one of their team members recorded and sent to us as well, created a short video and embedded it into an augmented reality app so that we could just print it onto a sticker and then place the sticker on the drone. While this micro training may not be all the training that a person needs in order to know how to safely operate a drone, if you think of this video in the context of refresher training or in the field performance support, it takes on a new usefulness. Since we are still on the topic of augmented reality, how about bringing a written reference manual to life by embedding digital resources into it and thus bringing the book to life with videos, infographics, and other digital assets? Let's talk some more about flipbooks. I recently had to create some training for human rights representatives. And one of the really important bits of content that we had to cover and refer back to often during the live training was their organization's policy on harassment and discrimination. You can see that when we go to this public page on their website, the policy is very long and very plain, which makes it really hard for learners to consume and make sense of. As an alternative, we transformed the exact words of the policy into an infographic style booklet, which we printed, but also embedded into a QR code to make it easy for everyone to access on the go. You can try it out too by scanning the QR code, then as usual, just tap on the little box that appears and it will take you directly to the flipbook. And just in case you're not able to check it out on your phone, here's a snapshot of what that policy looks like now. Huge difference from the original black and white words on a page. One last type of e-learning solution to tell you about, virtual reality. When I get to see you in person, I'll bring my VR goggles with me so you can try them out. In past decades, VR was something that only organizations with the deepest of pockets could use within their training programs. But the cost to play has come down significantly in terms of the equipment. Producing the programming, however, is still quite complex and time consuming. However, it's worth it when you have physical domain learning objectives and there's an element of danger or safety concerns. We see VR used extensively in the nuclear and aviation industries, as well as in the oil and gas sector, but VR definitely represents a growing opportunity. Are all of these approaches e-learning? Do you remember what I said way back at the beginning? That e-learning offers you a wide spectrum of digital choices? So yeah, they're all forms of e-learning. I get that the choices can be overwhelming. So here are three things you need to consider when choosing an e-learning solution. One, who's the learner? What's their demographic? What do we know about them? And how do they feel about this topic? Two, what's the learning objective? Are we tackling initial training with this solution? Or is it meant to be performance support that can be accessed from the field? And three, how do we expect learners to consume the training? If they work in offices and have access to desktop computers or laptops, that's a really different real estate than the, their salespersons who are out on the road all day and depending on mobile phones for their training information. There really is a strong case for self-directed training. It makes information accessible to everyone, regardless of their geography, and it allows us to provide performance and product support to employees and customers in ways that we could only imagine in past decades. But we both know that there's a big difference between effective training and that which is a waste of time. So I invite you to reach out to me to schedule a virtual coffee date. That way we can chat about your particular organization's challenges and goals and come up with a plan to tackle them together. In the meantime, you can download a free copy of my ebook, eLearning 101, by scanning the QR code on the screen. By now you know that if you tap that little box that appears, it will take you to the page 
where you can enter your name and email address and then you'll receive immediate access to the book which you can download and save. It's a handy reference guide to the e-learning vocabulary. If you'd like to schedule a virtual coffee, reach out to me by email or by LinkedIn or on WhatsApp. And now I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much um, for the presentation. Quite riveting information. Um, that was Janet Stewart on the future of learning. Um, I'm gonna open the session up for questions. I saw a question earlier, uh, Secretariat, for Bud. I just didn't write it down. I think it was in the line of Bud, whether or not the system that we are presenting, can it be used for other things other than HR? And I think, a colleague was raising issues related to procurement and so forth. But I also thought I should kick start with, with a few questions for both of you. Uh, let me start with Bud. But the, 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 verific the verification process, what does it entail uh, 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 in general, if you were to sum it up for us? And I think, Janet, great presentation, great learning solution. Um, I didn't see you speaking about costs uh, related to this um, transfer of like the policy into these other things, the type of learnings that you are putting forth. It would be interesting to check how, how, how much does an organization need to budget for to undertake this learning. And I think uh, on that basis, I think you can make further comments. I do not see secretariat in terms of hands. You'll help me see the hands of people that want to raise questions. But colleagues are welcome to type in the Q&A session uh, and then we can take it from there. Thank you so much. Over to you. Let's start with Bart. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sakele. And uh, I, I actually did did see and, and, and I tried to answer the question from, uh, I think it was from Ronnie, um, on, on whether um, the one HR center could be used for, um, for cooperation of this type in, in, in other areas. Um, I, I, that will be difficult, um, also because the software that we're developing, the database that we're developing is, is very specific. And, and as Ronnie already said, of course, the, the title of the center, One HR Center, implies that it, that it uh, focuses on, on HR processes. Um, of course, we can always change the title. Um, I, I, what, what I do think is that if, if the One HR Center and, and four years into its existence, it's still a little bit too early, but if we can um, demonstrate that this is a success, that we can actually um, come together as organizations and establish a, a global center that offers the same services to all these organizations and that this turns out to be more efficient, faster, um, cheaper for the organizations, then I think it would be a fantastic blueprint to do or to undertake similar types of efforts in, in, in other areas. Um, I, I think it's a little too early for that. Um, in, in other areas such as Procurement and finance, there is obviously cooperation. As I said earlier, harmonization is very important in the system. And although there are differences, there is always the ongoing attempt to harmonize. So there is cooperation, but this is uh, the One HR Center is, is fairly unique uh, or, or is unique um, as, as an experiment in a way. Um, and, and then your, your questions, okay, that's a very, very um, good question, a, a question that, that we, we hear very often. Um, so what does the background verification entail um, and, and background verification of, of candidates for jobs in the UN system has um, uh, gathered increased attention over the years, particularly in the context of, of um, misconduct, uh, sexual misconduct, um, other types of, of workplace misconduct. Uh, of course, the Me Too um, movement and, and, and everything that, that's related to it have, have affected the UN. And we all know the stories about uh, uh, sexual misconduct by uh, not only UN peacekeepers, uh, but also UN staff. I mean, they're always very widely broadcast. And of course, the organization always takes, um, it takes a very hit when it comes to, to reputation. And for the member states, it's extremely important that we are, are very detailed um, when, when we vet our candidates. Um, so as I said early in the presentation, um, what the 1HR Center does is what every organization would otherwise do. 
um, which is to make sure that everything that is being presented by a candidate is, is truthful. Um, has the candidate gone to that particular academic institution? Was this his or her um, uh, curriculum? Um, is this university accredited? Uh, did they actually uh, obtain the certificate? Um, and, and then when it comes to professional experience, did they really work for this organization? Was this really the time that they've worked there? Um, so that's um, uh, that's more about pro professional experience and, um, and academic credentials from, from a factual perspective, maybe, for lack of a better term. And then there's this other element of, of background verification, which is about conduct. Um, and I, I remember joining the UN many, many years ago, and, and, and the only question that I was asked about my, my conduct in the past, if I was ever arrested by the police, um, which is in and of itself a very problematic question, because I mean, that, 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 that all depends on the circumstances. Um, uh, now, maybe 15 years later, the organizations are much more specific. Um, there's all kinds of potential conduct that could be of, of influence to whether you are um, a suitable candidate for recruitment in one of the UN organizations. And as I said, the focus is now really on professional misconduct, uh, sexual uh, misconduct, sexual harassment, sexual exploitation. Um, so we, we ask former employers that have been submitted as a former employer, whether there's anything about um, the candidate's um, conduct that is um, relevant for us to know. And we ask quite targeted questions um, about professional misconduct. Um, then separately, as I said, we have a number of databases that we look at. We look at um, the Interpol database. Um, we, we obviously look at the United Nations Security Council sanctions list. Uh, the, the, the Security Council has, has imposed sanctions on on individuals who, um, are, for example, um, are, are related to, um, to terrorist organizations. So we, we, we have that list that we look at. Um, and then we have our internal UN um, sexual misconduct database um, that all, uh, all the UN um, entities participate in. They populate the database with, um, with cases of confirmed sexual misconduct. And then we make sure that when candidates move from one organization to the other, uh, had that, that, that individual um, is, is not in the database. Um, and at the moment we are, we are actually working on expanding um, our, our services in that area because we do believe that there are a number of, uh, a number of areas that, that we don't catch in our, in our current, um, in, in our current databases, in our current verification. So that's, uh, that's, that's quite comprehensive. Um, as I said, that, that's something that all the organizations already do. Uh, but they all do it separately and, and, and they don't really talk to one another um, have from, from the perspective of mutual recognition. Um, has, so the, the fact that 1HR exists makes that um, exercise um, so much easier. Uh, the exchange of information using information obtained by one organization for other organizations. Um, so that's uh, uh, hopefully, as I that's, uh, that's that's an answer to your question and hopefully for the audience that uh, gives a bit of a better um, understanding of what our background verification process entails. Thank you. No, no, no. That, that, thank you so much, but that's just, uh, uh, Janet, if you can just indulge us a bit. There's a question about uh, the, 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 the one HR system. Is it strictly uh, for UN? It's from Benedict Lewis. Uh, Yes and no. Uh, yes, because it is a, uh, a center that is established by the UN uh, organizations. Um, so it's owned by all the UN organizations. I, I just happen to work for one of the organizations that has been assigned to manage the center. Um, and uh, the idea at the time of its establishment was obviously to offer services to the different organizations that established it. Um, but uh, I think I mentioned this in the presentation, I, th there is a live discussion, maybe that's, that's the best way to describe it, um, whether as a one, as a one HR center, um, we should open our services up to, to other international organizations that, and there's of course a lot of international organizations that are not part of the UN system, but that operate in the same humanitarian field, development field, uh, or, or in other fields that are very closely related to, to the mandate of the different UN organizations. I mean, think to, Janet mentioned the, uh, the SDGs. I mean, we can, we can certainly think about that as well. So 
Um, at the moment, we're not really set up for that yet. Um, but as I said, it's it's a live discussion, um, and 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 I do think that, yeah, if we can come up with with some kind of model where we can also offer these services to other organizations, um, I, I I I don't see any principled objections to that. No. Thank you so much, Brad. Janet, uh, can I give over to you? I will. I'll address your question of cost, which is actually a very complex question. At one point, I mentioned that there is a huge spectrum of digital choices. And of course, of course, all of those different choices come with different price tags. But I will say this to try and provide some clarity. Uh, some projects that would be very small, like the example that I showed you with the drone, essentially you're creating a, a short video and embedding it into a QR code or in that case, an augmented reality um, sticker. That's a few thousand US dollars to do something like that. Uh, another example of a UN course, uh, the UN GGIM, which is the geospatial arm of the UN, uh, we took one of their 50 page documents and I know lots of organizations create these really awesome documents full of really fantastic content, but then they're so hard to consume that they just sit on websites and nobody really ever gets to them. So they had one such document that they asked us to bring to life. And I actually will be attending the, uh, a UN committee meeting tomorrow to unveil that to them. But we took that document, completely recreated it, and then also brought it to life through a course. Something like that, you're looking probably in the twenty to $30,000 range. And then of course I have projects that are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, again, if you've got multiple courses that you're creating that are self-directed and you're putting them together as a certificate program, that's a much bigger undertaking. And I will say this, that virtual instructor-led training, which is the live online piece, is less costly to produce than the self-directed type of training where the learner and the instructor are not there at the same time, but they come with pros and cons. When you have live instructor-led training, you still always have to have a time and date, which means that you have to be there at a certain time in order to benefit from that training. And it has a place, meaning a platform, just like we're on, on Zoom webinar today. And so you have recurring costs in terms of instructors. You, it replicates some of that in-person classroom uh, in terms of the, the complexity of organizing it and having everybody show up at the same time and having an instructor and whatnot. The self-directed can be accessed anytime, anywhere. And although there is a higher investment required to produce it initially, once it's up somewhere, once it's on a website or inside a learning management system, there are no recurring costs. It just is. And unless you need to update it at some point, which is very easy to do generally, uh, you know, you, it, it, the investment has already been paid for. So there's, hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea into the investment required. No, it does. Thank you very much. Um, I think that, that this is quite an interesting collision of worlds in terms of what we could do with technology, which is quite exciting. Um, and I think we could really learn a lot. I think those coffee dates must happen quite a lot. I hope everybody has taken down the email. So I'm gonna give you each one of you a second just to have a putting shot. I think this will be it for our session before I give over to Robert. Are there any putting shots from either of you? Did you wanna go Would you first? like to go first? I, I... <laughs> Ladies first? <laughs> okay. Uh, I would just say that uh, the self-directed training and, and to a large extent, virtual instructor-led training as well, offer an opportunity for us to level the playing field. It makes education and information more accessible to more persons, regardless of their geography and their socioeconomic status. And it allows them an opportunity to increase their own uh, aspirations, but also to lift their families, their communities, and their nations. And I think that it's in everyone's best interest to do whatever we can to get information and knowledge into the hands of the masses, because it is a game changer. Thank you, Janet. Uh, but Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zakele. Yeah, I, I, I think, as I, as I said earlier, it, um, uh, it it always or, or it often looks from the outside that that the UN is is one organization and uh, and it's very difficult to distinguish uh, between uh, the the thirty different or thirty plus different UN entities. But there there is a lot of differentiation in in practices um, and. Uh, 
at the same time, a lot of the organizations do the same or, or have to conduct the same type of, of work, particularly in the area of, of HR. So uh, the idea of, of, of a global center is, is, is um, as, as simple as it, as it is appropriate. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's the idea that, or the, coming up with the idea that's often not that difficult. Um, it's the implementation that's difficult. And, and all these organizations have their own mandates, their own budgets, um, their own priorities, their own individuals, their own culture. Um, and and to, to actually be able to, to start up the center, to get everyone to agree um, that we would start this, um, even though not mandatory, um, was in and of itself, I think, already a victory. And, and now, four years down the line, it's it's working. Um, it can work better, which is a fantastic challenge. Um, and, and that's why I'm happy yeah, that, 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 that I can help and, and bring the One HR Center further. But I think that that's, it, it, it exemplifies and illustrates that when you have common practices, common procedures, but you all do that separately, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to integrate these efforts and, and to try to find a way um, to, yeah, to integrate it in, in, in one location um, for, 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 for better efficiencies. Thank I, you, see, I see Robert is popping up. It must be an indication that we <laughs> should, should be done. I uh, thank you so much, both of you, for giving me the chance to chair this session. And I think Robert and the leadership, thanks for trusting me with this process. That is all from us, colleagues. Um, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sekeli. That was and, and Bart and Janet. That was a fantastic session, very interesting. And I'm just sorry that we didn't schedule enough time for a long enough Q and A. And and now that it's um, gone since 15, 15 minutes, that's okay. We're not going to eat into the next session. We'll allow Jackie uh, the, ne the, the the full half an hour. But um, that was a problem with 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 whether our scheduling really. I should have um, checked that. Okay, so um, that leads us to the next session, which is session four, and it's it's building a roadmap for organisational readiness. And the discussion lead is Dr. Jackie Jeffrey, and she's the senior lecturer at Middlesex University in the United Kingdom. Dr. Jackie is um, a senior lecturer in, in practice within Middlesex University Business School, where she has taught HR professional development and leadership programs for over 20 years. And uh, she has broadened her educational practices after developing an interest in neuroscience during her professional doctorate and now facilitates local and international placement experiences for herself, students and community partners in, in Europe, West and East and South Africa. So um, Je Dr. Jeffrey, can I please ask you to, um, to take over? Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. Now there's, I can control a lot of things in my life, but I can't necessarily control nature. So as you can see, the light's coming in from my window and you may hear the odd cockerel crow because although I'm usually based in the UK, one of the things this new normal has created for me is an opportunity to work from my parents' hometown, which is or home country, which is Antigua and Barbuda. So I have had the, the pleasure of being able to deliver Middlesex University courses and continue my usual work from my home country of Antigua and still do what I'm able to do. So I'm hoping that that in itself is an example. What I may do is swap over to my other screen, which has got a better background so you won't get the glare of the light as we go through if this becomes an issue. So hopefully by now I can share stuff with you. Can I get the the system so that I can send everybody a copy of the handout, please. And what I'll do is I'll start, while I'm doing that, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so it's been an interesting time for all of us, but nobody can say it's been without challenges. So what I'm hoping to do for the next 15 minutes or so, and Robert, can I ask you to send everybody a copy of the notebook? Yes, of course, I can do that, not a problem at Thank all. Thank you. So what I'm hoping to do for the next 15 minutes ago is to think about what it means for, to talk about organizational readiness and to think about an approach that you can start going to use to start to map and create your organizational technological landscape. 
But one of the things that came up very early in the keynote speeches is this need to take action. So we'll spend some time looking at what you need to do in terms of taking action before the questions and answers. So I got really excited when I was listening to all the speakers because so much of what has been said, we've all said and created separately, but when you put it together, it's giving us the same message. And one of the things that came out for me was this whole understanding of what it means to be ready. And what it means to be ready in many ways is understanding your habits, not only your personal habits, but your organization's cultural habits and how you go towards problem solving. Because one thing this situation has taught us is that nothing will ever be the same again. So this idea that what is in the old can be used and just recycled and no longer being taken into consideration. Now, this is a key concern to me because as a lecturer at Middlesex for over 20 years, I've taught lots of theory. And as one of your previous speakers was saying, theory without practice doesn't enable people to develop the skill sets that enables them to put that theory into practice. So spending my time working in South Africa to develop my doctorate, I became very aware of the localization agenda and got very scared that people like me from the UK would be left out. So I started to look for ways that I could begin to engage in that localization agenda. So much of what I'm sharing with you today is based on that and based on the way of thinking. And that's why this whole idea of being ready in terms of culture is, is key for me because we can talk about what we give the organization as HR, but what about us? Are we ready? Were we ready for what came at us a year ago? So when we talk about that, and when we try and look at how ready we were, I found this theoretical model that I thought may be of use to you. And it identifies the different types of readiness that have been identified to be able to take the most of dinner um, digital innovation. Robert should have shared with you by now a notebook. And I'm hoping that as an academic, I'm sorry, but I'm hoping that you use this as a tool to capture some of your thinking of some of the ideas that have emerged throughout this conference and look at ways that you can begin to share that not only with your team, but with the wider organization. In that um, notebook, you will see some hints about the things that you need to be looking at when you're thinking about organizational readiness. So very much I hope the next 15, 30 minutes, however long we get to spend together, is about you beginning to capture your thoughts and to use some of the tools that have been selected so that you can contain your thinking in a way that's useful for you when you go back into the workplace. So I have a video and we may not have time to show all of this, but this is a video that the World Health Organization drew up. And what I, want to, what I wanted to illustrate with this video is how much time we were being told about what was coming our way. And as much as we were talking in the organizations and being aware of it, it wasn't until we actually had no choice that we started to make the move. If we're actually gonna learn anything, the most important thing that we can learn is that we always need to be ready. So there's a, in your notebook, there's a little column where you'll see each of those resource um, readiness criteria put together. What I want you to do is to think of some of the stories that you can think of that link to each one of those hints. Just some stories, some ideas, some words, anything that comes to you. If you can't fill all of the boxes, that's not a problem. Over to you, you can play the video. A devastating epidemic can start the day. in this any country at any time and kill millions of people because we're not prepared. Because what were you doing we're in 2018? Vulnerable. 
What about 2019? Epidemiologic investigations are underway, but yes, it's certainly possible that there's limited human to human transmission. emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. We have a window of opportunity. While the number of cases, more than 99% are in China, in the rest of the world, we only have 176 cases. Let's use this window of opportunity to really invest in prevention, to invest in control and prevent this virus from spreading. It's time to act. The detection of this small number of cases could be the spark that becomes a bigger fire. And if the world doesn't want to wake up and consider this enemy virus as public enemy number one, I don't think we will learn from our lessons. We have over 400 scientists. There's been huge global interest in this topic and a real desire to collaborate and contribute. Our window of opportunity is narrowing. And that's why we called the international community to act. We've had enough countries now import disease. It is time to prepare. It is time to do everything you would do in preparing for a pandemic. All countries can be looking for cases right now. All countries can be aggressively finding those first cases and following those contacts over time. Shortages are leaving doctors, nurses, and other frontline health workers dangerously ill-equipped to care for COVID-19 patients. This is not a drill. This is not the time to give up. This is a time for pulling out all the stops. We're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Not testing alone, not contact tracing alone, not quarantine alone, not social distancing alone, do it all. You cannot fight a fire blindfolded, and we cannot stop this pandemic if we don't know who is infected. We have a simple message for all countries, test, test, test. We must get back to be able to uh, control this virus, live with this virus, develop the vaccines that we need to finally uh, eradicate this virus. Please work across party lines, across ideology, across beliefs, across any differences for that matter. That's how we can defeat this virus. Got a brand new iPhone 12.
Yeah, that one's not that 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 bit's not part of the video. Okay. So what I'm hoping that you took from that video is that it brought up some memories. Some memories that for some people they may choose um, to forget, but we are still living through it. And for many countries, while some people are getting a grip on it, some people are still living through it and going through it. And so what I want people to do is not think that because we seem to have a handle on it because we have some vaccines, that this means a return to what was there before. Things will never, ever be the same before. We must prepare ourselves so that we're never caught out like this again, where our economies, our business will not be able to withstand that, and HR can't continually trying to prepare people. One of the things that's clear, and I'm sharing these feelings with you, is just so that you're aware of the myriad of feelings that people went through during that time and are still going through whether or not it's in individual families, individual organizations, or as countries. As human beings, we are all going through this. But HR is supposed to be able to deal with all of this while we're dealing with our own stuff. And sometimes we're so used to giving that we don't take enough time to look and see how things have affected us. So within this organization, I found this and I thought it was a bit funny. I hope you see my sense of humor. We get a sense of all these different people reacting all differently to how situations happen. And HR is supposed to walk in on its charger and its magic wand and solve all the problems. Well, if anybody has found the ability to do that, please share it with the world because we all need it. One of the things that I think came up very much in the conversations that all the speakers were having was the importance of mindset. So what I've put together here, not knowing what everybody was going to say, which is why I was talking about how all these ideas are coming together, is this concept of fixed growth and benefit mindsets. <clears throat> now, all of these mindsets are included in an organization. But for many of us, the fixed mindset was the way we always did things, which is why one of your speakers was talking about what things would do, being able to monitor people, rather than focusing on the growth mindset where most of us at HR have tried to sit. And we're now moving on to this concept of a benefit mindset where the individual and the growth mindsets are put together. And very much your speakers today were talking about you need to focus on the mindset of the people. So if I'm going to advise you to do two things, and as I said, these two things have come out time and time again in these conversations, is who you have and what you have, all right? I have spent lots of time over the past 15 years looking at ways that you can support organizations to do this themselves without the cost of expensive consultants or the rest of it. I have the privilege of being able to have students who are eager to learn and want to learn new things. But within organizations, you need to focus your efforts on what you do and what you have. The rest of the world has got some really good ideas going on and really good things. But unless you find out where you're starting from, you're not going to be able to make the changes that you need to make to make the difference. So all of this starts with you. All right. Because the organization is the people. You've had that said time and time again. But if you're leading HR, if you're taking HR into the future and you haven't examined your own motivations, your own feelings, then you're not going to be able to enable other people to do it. So unless you're willing to walk the walk, don't talk the talk. Simple. Because why should I listen to you when I'm going through my trauma of all this digital world? It's new for everybody, irrespective of what their age is. Our organizations are older and therefore are built on a, a fixed, established and traditional systems. So it's new for everybody, irrespective of age, irrespective of where they come from the world. Everybody is learning to do things. And then you start to go and think, well, what, what am I going to share with my team? So in your workbook, I've created some questions that says, what are you going to take back to your team about this experience? What are you going to share with them? What are your leaders going to say? What do you think are going to be some of the attitudes? 
these are some of the things that will help you to get ready. These are some of the things that will know your organizational cultural habits and how you go to problem solving. So all times it may think that collaboration is better without people, you're not gonna be able to access and make the most of the digital re um, revolution or evolution, I should say, unless you begin to find new ways of working with and valuing your colleagues. Ha. So I found this 2013. So we talk about organization culture as if it's the easiest thing in the world to do. But I found this picture of Commonwealth leaders back in 2013. I imagine if I'd asked any of those leaders if they were willing to give up their culture and their identity and sacrifice that for something that was untested and unknown, that most of these people would have said no. Why would it be any different in organizations? So when you're going into organizations, you must understand your culture because without a change in culture, all of this stuff just sits on the surface. And exactly what your colleague with Tongo was saying, it goes nowhere because the rhetoric is there, but the resources are therefore not put in to underpin the effort. Or you can get stuck in the world that I sometimes get stuck in because as much as England is seen within the Commonwealth, I'm a black Caribbean living in the Caribbean with an English accent. And sometimes just the misunderstanding in language and perception can make a difference. And that doesn't matter whichever country you're in, you're gonna have that misunderstanding. People are gonna see things differently than you do. But within the change process, that has to be embraced and seen as just part of what you do. Because if everybody saw things the right way, I'm not sure where we'd be. So if you look in your notebook now, you're gonna see a section that calls mapping your organizational roadmap. One of, your, one of the um, speakers earlier said that you need to start with mapping. So I've um, used the model that maps against seven criteria. And in your workbook, in your notebook, you will see each of these criteria listed in terms of questions. You'll see each theme, and then you'll see the questions for now. And the now questions are the questions that you use to map where your organization now is in, in terms of your existing um, technology. We all know that there's things that we wish that we could have, but until you know what you're doing, you can't begin to move forward into that conversation. Once you have a clear understanding of that, at that point, you can set a digital vision. And that digital vision will outline what your organizational belief, purpose, and strategy is. And if you remember from the mindset about benefits, purpose lies at the key. If you think about what the people officer in the UK said, purpose lies at the key. So once you understand what your um, future value is and your future proposition, value proposition, whichever language you want to use, your next questions then move you into thinking about each of those different elements in terms of the investment for the future. And you'll see that hopefully, although we hadn't prepared this, each of the um, themes that I've identified have emerged throughout the conversation today. So you should have things that you want to ask, that you want to build and that you want to grow. But it's not just enough to do the talk, as I keep on saying. And speaker after speaker has emphasized the need for communication. Communication vertically and communication horizontally. By vertically, I mean sitting on the board. And HR, I kind of, I've been working in the HR um, field for a long time. And I'm kind of tired of HR being used to, um, to f worry people, to threaten people. We have a right to sit at the table. Whether we've been arguing this for years and people didn't understand, the businesses that exist today are because of the quality and the resilience and the flexibility of their people. That gives us our right to sit at the table. Whether or not we own that right depends on the knowledge and the experiences that we accumulate to do what of your, what, what your speakers said was to speak a language. I've just finished running a three-day simulation for HR managers on a business simulation. 
very little to do with HR, all to do with profits and loss, getting loan statements, making sure that you've got market share. Because for a lot of HR people, we spent so long speaking the language of people that we've forgotten how to speak the language of business. And a lot of the time I spend speaking to the language of business. The whole idea about matrix is important. I went out and did some research um, in terms of UK HR market and their feelings about data and analytics. And I've, I'm proud to be able to say that I'm one of, Middlesex is one of the first universities to make da um, data and people analytics as part of their masters in HR. And we're lucky to have Professor Andrew Mayer, who's one of the leading people and Sam Hill who works for the CIPD to do it. But we had to learn that producing that course was about overcoming HR's fear of numbers. Because many people go into HR because it doesn't have a lot of numbers. Those games have changed. So this is why you need to think about how you use your HR technology, that you see all staff, including yourself, as digital talent. You need to push yourself to do things that you wouldn't usually do. So that when you're asking people to do the same, you understand how it feels. Speaker after speaker reminds you emotions are important. Emotions drive your actions. And I've used the six hats technology within your notebook to get you to start to think about your own feelings. Okay. Now, one of the things HR must do is keep up to date. Now, I put the link into one of my favorite resources here, people. And if you can access it now while I'm talking and having a conversation and just look at the transformation maps, you will get a sense of the potential it offers you as an HR practitioner to update yourself with technology in ways that most people don't know. It's a fantastic resource. And as an HR practitioner who's so fixed on looking after other people that they haven't sought to update themselves. It provides a fantastic up-to-date resource. And I know that um, CTO are planning to do exactly the same for you to support your learning. So while you see all current staff as digital talent, you also have got to start acquiring that diligent talent. So I'm coming to the end, but we've got so used to using your text but when I started to think, well, how else can, can I communicate that? And I put the same words inside a Google search. These were some of the words that I came up. It means exactly the same thing, says something different. I tend to be the one in the red, if you can see walking in the other direction. We have to have more people in the organization willing to walk in other directions. And we have to have the people in the other directions willing to accept and support them. HR, you need to get your data in place. You have valuable information about how your people coped with this situation that will help you cope with any future, anything in the future. That we all know is a massive task. And even in that list of resilience areas, you can see that you can't do it all at one time. So as we have here, you can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. So once you've started to do all of this, please never stop. Keep measuring success. Start again, because we started getting that warning back in 2018. I can tell you before I remember um, Obama talking, President Obama talking about we need to start thinking in the lines of what happens if. The move toward localization and producing stuff for yourself is really key and important to that. But there are people like me out there who are wanting to help you, who are wanting to support you and believe that you've got it all yourself. What you need is the support as you would need from any colleagues to have a conversation. Because that intersection between connecting people and places and ideas is where human beings meet. And I think that's, that's me. Any questions? Always seems impossible until it's done, folks. Did I do my time, Robert? You did. You did it bang on bang on half an hour. You can tell you're a professional. Thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any 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 questions for for Jackie before before she leaves? Um, I, I think 
I, you know, you've all been sent the notebook now. There were a couple of late registrants uh, this morning on last night that may have not received the email. And if anybody hasn't received it, just email me and I can forward it on to you. Um, but um, Jackie is uh, is here. And, 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 you know, if you do have any questions surrounding it, um, uh, please uh, maybe take the questions up, you know, come, come back to us. We can we can find you an answer if you have if you have further questions. But I think that's a good, good, uh, certainly a very good presentation about how to, to build a, a roadmap for organizational effectiveness. Thank you very much, Jackie, for your time. It looks beautiful light out there in, in, in Antigua. So it's like uh, everybody knows who's around in the Caribbean or this area. It's 8, 8 15 in the morning here. Ah uh, yeah, of course. Well it's a little bit brighter than London, but London's not too 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 great today. So um, I'm gonna pass over now to um, thank you very much um, again uh, once again. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass over now to um, Ms. Let Ms. Letang um, Kekwaletswe. Now, Letang is the Capacity Development Manager at the CTO to share, to share the lessons from the, from the forum for the Programme for Development and Training. Thank you very much, Chair. Distinguished guests, speakers and participants, on behalf of the CTO, I would like to thank you for your contribution and the commitment you've shown to this event. At the CTO, we are excited and we are actually energized by the discussions that have taken place since morning. Speakers have imparted knowledge and have shared insights, and it is our hope and belief that uh, a participant will walk away with something that is tangible, something that they can transfer and apply in their working environment. There was a, a statement that was made earlier I think it was by Mr. Blanchard about the importance of knowledge and skills transfer to the work environment after learning has taken place. He also went on to mention the gaps that exist in that area, that there is hardly any application. Uh, Letty, sorry to interrupt, I do apologize. Um, could you just um, turn your camera on, please? We can't see your face. Ah, uh, uh, no, 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 Can, you don't, we're just seeing a blank screen at the moment. That's it, perfect, thank you. It's okay now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So based on that statement, I just wanted to highlight to the participants that there is, this is something that is of great concern to the CTO. We've, we've been wondering why there is loss of skills and loss of knowledge after people have participated in the uh, uh, learning event. And that is why the CTO has decided to chart a new course, as the SG has already said it charting a new course for the CTO. So ever since the SG came on board, we've had so many discussions, you know, going back and forth, uh, 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 trying to come up with innovative ways and creative ways of making capacity uh, building activities and programs. Uh, you know, sorry. Coming up with ways of making uh, capacity building interventions impactful. So at this point in time, I'm pleased to inform you that the CTO is committed to ensuring that all of our capacity building activities and programs will make an impact both at organizational level and national level. There was a statement made by another speaker, I think it was Lara, who indicated that capacity building is a national investment. And from the CTO standpoint, we are no longer going to provide capacity building for the sake of doing it, but we want to be able to measure impact. And we are going to make sure that capacity building programs contribute towards socioeconomic development. So in terms of lessons learned, from the, learned for the program for development and training, commonly known as the PDT, there are several factors that the CTO will be considering going forward. Firstly, we endeavor to assist organizations to transform digitally. And that is through the provision of digital skills training at affordable prices. You may recall that the CTO has different uh, membership categories, ranging from small islands, least developed countries, developed countries, so on and so forth. And so regardless of the member's economic status or developmental status, the CTO seeks to ensure that Members have access to learning programs at affordable rates. It is through the provision of the digital skills program that we will not only be addressing the skills deficiencies that exist in our member countries and organizations, 
but we will also be bridging the digital divide. In a nutshell, we'll be killing two birds with one stone. So what the city is going to do from here is ensuring that our members can consume and access learning content easily, and also making sure that our learning solutions are more engaging, interactive, and adopting. We are also going to adopt an integrative approach to capacity building. Secondly, considering how learning has evolved over the years, how people learned in the 18th and 19th century has changed dramatically. For us to remain relevant in the 21st century, we have to make sure that we embrace and integrate technology into our learning and development strategies, processes, and practices. We now have a generation that was born in the era of, of, of technology. And so how they learn is totally different from how you and I learn. Mr. Blanchard rightly said it, that if we fail to leverage on technology for the enhancement of capacity building programs, then we will stumble along the way. On the other hand, we have an explosion. We have, sorry, we've seen an explosion in, in social media platforms in the likes of uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, just to name a few. And we all know that people spend most of their time in these platforms. And so this is where we need to avail our learning content and solutions. So the C2O will, in the near future, make sure that our learning content and many solutions are accessible from these uh, platforms. Thirdly, as HR practitioners, there is need for us to rethink measurement and evaluation of learning. Mr. Blanchard alluded to that earlier on. Considering the fact that learning delivery methods have changed, and even the way people learn or their styles of learning, we've seen a change in that. So, we're going to have to rethink how, how we measure and evaluate uh, the effectiveness of learning programs and solutions. Traditionally, we've always confined measurement and evaluation to post completion. But that narrative is changing, is now changing. On the other hand, we have tools that now allow for learners to dip in and out of the content anytime, anywhere. And again, these days, it is possible for a learner to acquire a skill without necessarily having to complete the entire course. And so the key question here is, how then do we measure and evaluate uh, learning under the circumstances? Well, I'm hopeful that in the next forum, we will have answers to some of these questions. And last but not least, my advice to all HR professionals in this forum. We are all aware that the HR landscape has changed significantly, demanding for new skill sets and competencies. We can see that things are getting complicated and a little complex. And so as we focus on building competencies and capacity for our organizations, let us not neglect our own development as reiterated by Dr. Jackie. Let's make sure that we empower ourselves we upskill ourselves so that we are better placed to help our organizations navigate through the challenges and changes posited by the market environment. In conclusion, here at the CTO, we trust that you've all found the discussions meaningful, meaningful and beneficial, and hopefully you will have something to take with you to your work environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Letty. And I don't know if you could just check the Q and A. You don't have to answer it now, but there's a request for um, you to share the the, the, the program um, for training. Okay, so um, thank you very much. The next um, speaker uh, to to participate in this program is Ms. Dorothy Ellengard, and Dorothy is the um, CTO, Human Resources and Administration Manager. And um, she will be giving the vote of thanks for the conference to, to the conference. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. All protocols observed. Our most valuable invited speakers, session chairs, panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is my, my privilege on behalf of the CTO to give heartfelt vote of thanks to everyone here today. A big thank you to the keynote speaker, Robert McNair, 
for giving us an excellent, an excellent, an excellent coverage of the theme for the event today. He spoke about the technology, how technology is changing in the civil service. He gave us examples of the enablers and the challenges we have we have to deal with, and mostly when using data. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to, this, to the chairs for their masterful handling of the sessions and focusing the attention of the audience in the important, on the important issues. I also wish to express my gratitude and to the speakers and panelists. We were fortunate to have a group of eminent speakers and panelists all subject matter expertise, who freely shared their ex expertise and wide experience. They brought the subject matter to life in practical ways. And I would like to acknowledge our gratitude to Dr. Jackie Jeffrey for opening our eyes to the realities of change as she led us in the development of the roadmap for organization readiness. We greatly value the participation of our HR and IT practitioners and other delegates who join us and by their active interaction enriched the engagement. Thank you for staying the course. Last and not least, I would like to thank the team of motivated and dedicated secretariat staff who worked tirelessly in organizing this event. We are very gratified of what we have collectively accomplished today. And I thank you all for your splendid support for the HR and ICT Forum 2021. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dorothy. Uh, nicely said, and, 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 and that was uh, very much needed. Um, so before we finish this forum, I invite you to complete the event survey that will help CTO assess the success of this event and plan future events as well. And the survey will show up on your screen once the event ends, okay? Um, but it'll also, be, it'll also be sent to you in an email uh, tomorrow, 24 hours after the event, uh, which will be an email generated by Zoom. So. For if you don't wish to fill it in now, you can always fill it in tomorrow. But but please, uh, within, it doesn't doesn't take long, and we'd very much welcome your feedback. So if um, it's the sooner the rather, the sooner the better, really. Um, I can also confirm that an event report will be published on the CTO event site within two weeks of this event, and that the video clips uh, will be up, some some of the video clips will be uploaded onto the CTO's YouTube channel. And we'll, again, if we you can give allow us two weeks for that. Um, we hope that you have enjoyed listening to the speakers and listed at this event and CTO looks forward to working with members to continue the important discussions on human development and ICTs and we invite you to contact us with, with should you wish to uh, a partner uh, with CTO on future projects and whether there's um, and whether that's a training provision events that like such as this um, or research consultancy support. Um, I have one reminder, um, and that is for PDT liaison officers, and um, that's members of the program for development, development and training. So it doesn't, rep it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, it's not a, an announcement for everybody that's in attendance right now. But the annual meeting of PDT liaison officers will be will take place tomorrow, and you should have received an email notification from the secretariat already. It takes place at ten o'clock, um, and that's so that's six, the sixth of May at ten o'clock and it'll be taking place on Zoom. So um, we look forward to meeting with you tomorrow at that meeting. Uh, we hope that you enjoy your day today. Um, it's, um, it's just beginning for you in the Caribbean. Um, it's um, obviously come to an end in the Pacific and, uh, and, and, and it's drawing to an end in Asia, but, um, but we've still got the afternoon in, in, in Europe and, and, and Africa. So enjoy your day and thank you very much again um, and goodbye. So thanks very much. And this is the end of the forum, but thank you. We look forward to meeting again soon. Okay, bye-bye.